Well, the polls just closed on the October primary in Louisiana, and dozens of local and statewide offices are up for grabs. Good evening, and thanks for joining us, everyone, on election night. I'm Cherie Skipson. We have team coverage tonight with eight reporters covering the top contests from the governor's race on down to the council races in Jefferson, the St. Tammany Parish President's race, as well as the local propositions. My colleague Katie Moore is joining us on the analyst desk tonight. Yeah, Cherise, thank you. I'm here with our panel of election experts, the crew that we see every election night, pollster and strategist Silas Lee, political uh, analyst Ron Fauche, of course, Clancy Dubos, WWL-TV's political analyst and Gambit columnist with us with the Times-Picayune as well. These three men are three of the best election political minds in our state, and we're lucky to have them with us tonight. They're going to be breaking down the latest returns and helping us call all the races. We're going to dig into the numbers with them in just a moment. All right, Katie, thank you. The governor's race is, of course, the top contest, and Attorney General Jeff Landry has led in the polls since the Louisiana Republican Party endorsed him almost a year ago. Paul Murphy is live for us in Broussard at Landry's election night headquarters. Paul. Sharice, welcome to the ballroom in Broussard. We are at the Jeff Landry watch party and take a look. You can see that there are signs hanging throughout the hall that say this is Jeff Landry country and it is. While he was born and raised in St. Martinville, he and his family now live in Broussard, which is a suburb of Lafayette. Landry attended mass this evening and will watch the votes come in at his home just down the road from here. And you can see the hall is beginning to fill up here. Uh, Landry was the front runner coming into today's election and tonight we'll learn where he lands when the votes are counted. We're live in Broussard, Paul Murphy, Eyewitness News. Paul, oh, thank you. And Landry, of course, was the man to beat, and he's facing a field of 14 other candidates after Mandeville Republican Richard Nelson dropped out of the race. He made that announcement too late for his name to be removed from the ballot. Republican Stephen Wagesback is considered a top challenger. He was an executive in the Jindal administration, and Alyssa Curtis is joining us live now from Baton Rouge at Wagesback's election night headquarters. Alyssa, what's the mood like? Good evening, Katie and Cherise. Yeah, the uh, supporters of Stephen Waggis Pack have been rolling in since just before 7 p.m. and everyone seems excited, but also just anxiously waiting those results to come in. Now, Waggis Pack was in the room just a moment ago speaking to supporters and he has been for the last hour or so. We actually just got to speak with him just a minute ago and he said that he is very excited and of course anxiously waiting to see where he lands in this governor's race. But his family is here standing by him and two of his sons actually got to vote for him tonight so of course that was a very special moment for him one of his sons just turned 18 so this is his first election so Waggis Pack told us that he is just very happy that he got to spend that special moment with his family again this room is very anxiously waiting but excited to see where Waggis Pack lands as he's trying to challenge Jeff Landry Waggis Pack was the former top aide of former governor uh, Jindal so he does have a little bit of that experience in politics, but he just stepped down as CEO of the Louisiana Association of Business and Industry. So he says that he's not necessarily on the inside of politics, but he does know, of course, how it works. So he says that will be a great asset to the people of Louisiana. Of course, since he entered the race in March, he has um, explained his pro-business uh, standpoint and his campaign. So, of course, he's hoping that the people of Louisiana will put their trust in him today as he hopes to become your next governor. We'll have more tonight as those results come in, and I'll be sure to keep an eye on what this room is looking like throughout the night. Reporting in Baton Rouge, Alyssa Curtis, Eyewitness News. Alyssa, thank you so much. Well, the highest polling Democrat in the governor's race is Sean Wilson. He served as the state transportation secretary starting in 2016. Now, Wilson has been endorsed by the state Democratic Party, Governor Edwards, and Congressman Troy Carter. His election night headquarters is here in New Orleans, and that is where we find Whitney Miller this evening. Well, good evening, Cherise. We are live in the ballroom of the Westin, and the, the watch party here for Sean Wilson just got in underway about an hour ago. Things kicked off here. The supporters have been trickling in, and it does feel like the mood is high here in hopes for Sean Wilson to see where he lands in the polls. It seems like the spirits are high. The stage has been set behind me, um, and so we are just watching and waiting for Sean Wilson. I'm told he'll come out later on uh, and talk to 
message to us and to some of the supporters that are here tonight for him. But the mood is high and everyone is excited to see uh, where this election will take Sean Wilson. I'll send it back to you reporting at the West End. Whitney Miller, Eyewitness News. All right, it should be an interesting night. Thank you, Whitney. Now the races for local elections are just as hot as the governor's race and those statewide races. The race for parish president in St. Tammany has two political veterans facing off tonight with incumbent Mike Cooper facing Slidell Mayor Greg Cromer. Cooper picked up some big endorsements in the race, but he's also made some enemies during his time in office, and he has clashed with the city council a lot of the time, the parish council rather. Lily Cummings is joining us live at Cooper's election night headquarters in Covington with the latest on what's happening in St. Tammany. Lily? Katie, good evening. We are live at Bogafalaya Hall at the Furman Auditorium here in Covington at the watch party for incumbent Mike Cooper, as you just said, Republican incumbent Mike Cooper. Now, he told us that he spent the day driving across St. Tammany, waving signs, thanking supporters, and now he's been here for about an hour or so. We got to talk to him earlier. He said he's feeling good as the night goes on. Folks have been pouring in for the last hour or so, drinking, eating, playlist is strong, catching up on the LSU game. They're having a good time, and they're feeling confident that Mike Cooper will go home as the uh, St. Tammany Parish president for his second term tonight. They're hopeful for that. They said um, that this room is where Mike Cooper was whenever he found out that he was Covington mayor two times in a row. This is also the room where he was in 2019 when he was elected parish president for the first time. So he's hoping that that winning streak will continue tonight. But of course, time will tell. Reporting live in St. Tammany, Lily Cummings, Eyewitness News. All right, Lily, thank you so much. Well, Cooper faces Slidell Mayor Greg Cromer. He served as a state representative and was chairman of the insurance committee and was elected mayor of Slidell in 2018. Rachel Henley is following the returns and Slidell for us and joins us live from Cromer's election night headquarters. Yeah, Sherry, so we're here in Old Town Slidell at the corner of First and Robert. It's a beautiful night and the election night party is just starting to fill up. As you both mentioned, this has the potential to be a very tight race between Cromer and Cooper. We have been uh, talking to uh, Greg Cromer all night and he says he is very optimistic about the results of this race and mentioned that if he is elected on his first few months in office, his main priority it will be to forge good relations with Parish County. Council. Uh, again, we are here in Old Town Slide Owl. Rachel Handley, Eyewitness News. All right, Rachel, thank you so much. Well, the race for at-large District B is also predicted to be a very close contest. District 4 Council member Dominic Impostato is taking on incumbent Scott Walker, which has been a very heated race. New Orleans businessman Sidney Torres, whose company recently lost the Kenner trash contract, isn't running, but his political action committee has spent some $200,000 in ads attacking candidates from Kenner, especially Impostato. Meg Fair is joining us now. She's covering that part of the race for us tonight. Meg. Well, good evening, Sharice. Photojournalist TJ Pipitone and I will be back and forth between the Dominic Empastado campaign headquarters and Scott Walker, where we are right now in Old Metairie. And as you mentioned, it has been a hotly contested and bitter campaign at some points, each man uh, having a war chest, a campaign war chest of more than $200,000. Now, if you live in Jefferson Parish, you know your mailbox has been packed with those glossy, colorful flyers um, from the candidates uh, talking about their opponent in negative ways and also touting their accomplishments. Your phone has probably been blowing up with text messages from each of them saying what a good job they have already done. Now, th these two candidates are incumbents, and this is, the, according to the registrar in Jefferson Parish, this is the first time in about 20 years where you've had four Republican incumbents vying for two seats, two at large seats, and um, that's why it's gotten contested. Now, he's told us that he believes it's, it's going to be to the wee hours because it's going to be very close. Scott Walker just walked in and told me that his polling, his lowest polling, he was 14 points ahead, and in every other poll that his campaign has taken, there have been even more than that ahead. But, of course, it all depends on if your voters get out to vote. So we'll be going back and forth from Kent with the Empasado campaign here in Old Metairie with the Walker campaign, and we'll be bringing you those results and their speeches later on in the evening. Reporting live for WWL, Meg Farris in Old Metairie.
second hot race. I'm on the analyst desk tonight. Polster, Silas Lee, and of course Ron Fauche here with me. You know, this really is going to get going pretty um, hot, heated, and fast as we start getting these election results in. I know uh, Clancy can't wait to talk to us in just a second. Sure. Um, any initial thoughts quickly? Well, one of the things that uh, I think we should be looking at is voter turnout. Mm -hmm. Most people think this election hasn't engendered much enthusiasm. Four years ago, 46% turned out in the primary. Eight years ago, 39%. So those are two benchmarks we want to see if it, if it exceeds either one of those or is somewhere in between. Yeah, it's something we'll find out sure. as we continue throughout the night. Uh, Silas, any <laughs> initial thoughts from you? You know, this election has been somewhat ap um, <clears throat> real slow. Mm -hmm. And it's lethargic compared to previous governor's races where we saw a lot of on-the-ground activity. We saw a lot of um, momentum from the candidates in terms of visibility. Mm -hmm. But at this particular time, we didn't see it. They, they all engaged in a different campaign strategy. Mm -hmm. Yep, the internet and social media, I think, has been a big game changer, including cell phones, which have played a significant role text in messaging. this race. Right. Yes, the text messages have been coming fast and furious today. But, you know, we do have some analysis that we want to get sure. to with Clancy Dubos, our political analyst. He's got some of the initial numbers for us. Clancy? Mm -hmm. What we're seeing here, this is the map of the state. It's color-coded to different candidates. Uh, these are basically the early voting results results, folks. This is not actual election day results, or if it is, it's very little. Uh, what happens in many parishes, but not all, the first thing that gets loaded in will be the early voting results. And so you're seeing from about three-fourths of the parishes, but not necessarily three-fourths of the population, because we don't have New Orleans, we don't have Shreveport, and we don't have East Baton Rouge. So there's a lot of vote uh, early votes still out there, but what we're seeing is a pattern, and it doesn't surprise me. You're seeing Jeff Landry run first and Sean Wilson run second. Uh, between John Schroeder, Stephen Wagaspak, and Hunter Lundy, they could get jumbled up as the night goes on, but for right now, the early returns in the early vote shows Landry first and Sean Wilson second. And I think it's safe right now to say, and I, I don't mind projecting, Jeff Landry will run first tonight. The big question is, will he get a majority, as he currently has, among some of the early votes, the early returns? But, uh, you know, the, and he's certainly trying for that. But whether he continues to run at this pace as the night wears on, we'll see. But I can project right now, and I'm pretty sure Mr. Fauche and, and Dr. Lee will uh, agree with me on this. Jeff Landry will run first, and the likelihood is that Sean Wilson will run second, and we'll see if, if there's a runoff or not. And through the night, we're going to be zooming in. For example, here's St. Tammany. We can see that Jeff Landry got 43.3% of the early vote in St. Tammany compared to John Schroeder, who is from St. Tammany, who got 20%. So Jeff Landry did very, very well in John Schroeder's backyard. And if you go over to, say, the Lafayette area in, the, uh, in, in Lafayette Parish, you can see Jeff Landry, where he lives in the neighboring parish of Iberia in, uh, in St. Martin, he gets 57% of the vote. Sean Wilson gets almost 26%. So we're going to see that pattern as, as the evening wears on, I believe. And you can see the green here are parishes where Sean Wilson is running first in the early vote, and the red is where Jeff Landry is running first in the early vote returns. Now, that is not election day returns. These are among the voters who turned out to vote early. So I'm going to throw it back to Katie now, and we'll be back here, and I'll be on the set sometimes and over here sometimes, depending on what the analysis needs to be. And let's jump back quickly for the early, for the total. And you can see Landry statewide, 51.8, Sean Wilson, 23.2, among the returns in early voting. All right, Clancy, you're getting out of the gate fast, making an early projection. <laughs> and, it's pretty uh, obvious. Pretty obvious. All right. You, you gentlemen agree? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, we're going to continue to have more election results on our special election night coverage for this big gubernatorial race and all these other parish-wide races as well. But we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back.
All right, welcome back to our 2023 campaign coverage. Some very big races that we are covering. One of the races we just gave you a slight peek at was the race for Parish Council, Jefferson Parish Council at large. We want to go now to Leah McNeil. She is over at Jennifer Van Branken's uh, campaign headquarters. Leah, uh, what do you have going on there? Well, Cherise, folks have already been cheering at those preliminary results that are just starting to roll in since the polls closed about 17 minutes ago. As you mentioned, I'm here in Metairie at Jennifer Van Vreken's watch party. She isn't here yet, but she is expected to be here um, once those official results come in and give a speech right here behind me. About 30 minutes ago, we were in Gretna at Ricky Templet, the incumbent in this race for Council at Large Division A. We did speak to his team, and they are optimistic about this race as well, as we all know. The polls closed again 17 minutes ago, so both parties are still very optimistic as those results continue to roll in. Reporting live in Metairie, Leah McNeil, Eyewitness News. All right, Leah, thank you so much. We want to go back out to Lily Cummings. She's live at, uh, she's with Mike Cooper, if I'm not mistaken, at his, uh, where his campaign headquarters are this evening. Lily. Okay, looks like we may be having some it's mic issues. It's just been issues. bustling oh, with people ever since about 7 p.m. And since about 7 p.m., folks have been filling the room in support of Mike Cooper. You're looking at a crowd of people eating, drinking, waiting for these results to roll in. Now, Mike Cooper, I did speak with him in the last hour or so. He said that he spent the day driving across St. Tammany, waving signs, checking in with supporters, thanking them for their support. Now he's been here in Bogafalaya Hall at the Furman Auditorium in Covington for about an hour, hour and a half now. This is where he told me he was when he found out that he won Covington mayor twice, then parish president in 2019. He also says that recently his administration won a red beans and rice competition here. So he's hoping that the luck will continue here at the Furman Auditorium. Again, we spoke to him in the last hour. He said he's feeling pretty good. I'm feeling great tonight uh, after a beautiful day here in St. Tammany Parish. Sunlight, uh, just a beautiful day, uh, cool winds, and lots of people out and about in the parish as I uh, drove around today, uh, going to every, every community in every part of the parish uh, to, uh, to see how the voting was going. Were you knocking on doors? Waving signs, what were you doing today? I joined people that were waving signs at, at major intersections uh, across the community. I got out and thanked them and uh, waved at uh, those who passed by and, and gave them a hand and, and showed my appreciation. If tonight renders successful for you, what can we look forward to in your second term? Well, I'm looking forward to continuing the endeavors that we've begun uh, in this first term uh, with regards to uh, investing in infrastructure for our roads, bridges, drainage, utilities and coastal restoration and flood protection. All of those things were, were a high priority for me this term and many are un currently underway and we have plans for uh, future projects as well. Anything? One more question, just talk about why it's just so important to continue your leadership here. Well, I've assembled the team. And Cooper has also told us in the past that he's proud of how his administration handled COVID and Hurricane Ida. He's been faced with a lot of challenges in the last four years as parish president. But of course, as you heard just then, his focus in the next four years, if reelected tonight, is infrastructure. Now, he told us that that will be his number one focus because he believes the development has outpaced the parish. Now, as you all were talking about earlier, Cooper has had somewhat of a contentious relationship with the parish council here in St. Tammany over the last four years. And um, we do know that the parish council will have at least six new faces, if not 13, after today's election. So we will be watching that closely as the results roll in as well. For now, reporting live in St. Tammany, Lily Cummings, Eyewitness News. All right, significant changes on tap over in St. Tammany tonight. Of course, the election, uh, the race that we are all watching with bated breath is the governor's race. Who is going to lead Louisiana for the next four years? And our two political analysts are here to talk, give us a little perspective. We're just now seeing the early votes come in. We're not seeing a large number, a large slug of votes coming in from any particular parish at this point. So let's talk a little bit about the history uh, that we are witnessing tonight and the history that we have seen in Louisiana's governor's office. Ron, you know, you're an expert in this. What do you expect tonight? And give us a little perspective. 
Well, you know, it's an open election. You don't have an incumbent running. Um, the state has kind of gone back and forth between Republican and Democratic governors, even though it tends to be more of a Republican state. So, so that's something to look at. And, and the national political parties are looking at Louisiana as well as Kentucky and Mississippi in that light. Uh, one thing I'm looking at is uh, uh, if, if Jeff Landry is elected governor, he will be the first attorney general to get elected governor of Louisiana since World War I when Rufin G. Pleasant was elected, oh. who happened to be the first uh, um, captain of the LSU football team, by the way. Huh. And, and that was in uh, 1916. So, so we'll see if most of the governors have tended to be members of Congress, state legislators, public service commissioners, or lieutenant governors. So we'll see if, a, if an attorney general wins. In other parts of the country, attorney generals generally do pretty well in governor's elections. All right, we'll have to see what happens tonight. Dr. Lee, we were talking about personas, and there are very distinct personas that have been established by these candidates, whether or not they um, are real or not, these are what they wanted to portray to the voters. So what can you, what perspective can you give us on that? You know, I noticed that each candidate developed a personality and a style that they presented to the voters in the media. So you had Schroeder, he presented himself as the reformer, someone who would look at accountability. Then definitely you had um, Landry who said that, look, I'm here, I will be tough on crime, I will be a conservative in protecting the values of the state. And um, with Wilson, he wanted to portray himself as someone who has won the experience to work on both sides of the aisle, he knows government, and therefore voters should entrust him with the leadership of the state. So you notice that they all developed a style with Sharon Hewitt, she wanted to present herself as someone, yes I have experience. And and she wanted to demystify some of the characteristics or stereotypes associated with women running for office. So each candidate developed a style and a persona that they really stuck to. They didn't deviate from that extremely and they want, wanted to see if that would give them the, the momentum in terms of enhancing voter enthusiasm and their support to make it to the runoff. We didn't see Jeff Landry in any debates no. around the state. How significant is that for what we're witnessing tonight as we start to see these results come in? That's very significant in the fact that a lot of people anticipated him to engage in debates, but he made it quite clear. I'm the front runner, there will be limited appearances. You didn't see him make a lot of public appearances, no. but he did engage in a very strategic uh, social media campaign and he capitalized basically on his name recognition and the fact that he is the sitting attorney general. And that persona that you just talked about and really spelled out for us, I mean, I think that plays a big role. He was able to successfully get that message out there. At least that's what that appears. I think his perception his attitude was voters know me, Mm -hmm. I don't have to change perceptions. Mm -hmm. So let me just continue to enhance that awareness and level of comfort with voters. All right, Clancy Dubos, our political analyst, is standing by with some more numbers for us. What you got, Clancy? Well, first of all, I want to thank Ryan Fauche for acknowledging his law school classmate, Rufin Pleasant, uh, <laughs> the last attorney general to get in. No, but, uh, as I'm looking at this map, folks, it's color-coded. Red is Landry and green is Sean Wilson. There is no other candidate who is in the lead among early votes. And I, I have to say, it's, it's 827. So I suspect that we're also seeing some returns that are actually election day results. And we talked about St. Tammany Parish the last time we were here. And you see where Jeff Landry got 43.3% to John Schroeder's 20% in St. Tammany, which is John Schroeder's home parish. Let's look at Jeff Landry's home parish. S almost 74% for Landry, and still Sean Wilson in second place with almost 18%. But let's look at also these green parishes. These are parishes where Sean Wilson is in the lead. These are also, they happen to be parishes where, with a significant, if not majority, African-American voter registration. Here in uh, St. Helena Parish, 
Sean Wilson runs first with 47 plus percent of the vote. In East Feliciana, 44.6 percent for Wilson. In the River Parishes, first in St. John the Baptist, 52, a majority for Sean Wilson. And in St. James Parish, Wilson is narrowly ahead of Jeff Landry. Now this is in the early voting. So, and when you see East Baton Rouge and Orleans and Caddo, Shreveport come in, you will see Wilson likely run first in those parishes as well. But I think the order of finish, let's get back to the total, the order of finish between the first and second is likely not to change. The question is, will Jeff Lantry continue to get more than 50%? And how much of a gap will be between Sean Wilson, the very likely second place finisher, and everybody else? And also, just for people like me and Dr. Fauché and Dr. Lee, because we like to figure out who might have been who runs third between Schroeder, Waggis Pack, and Hunter Lundy? It'll be one of those three. Okay, remind people out there, Clancy, quickly, what does Jeff Landry need to avoid a runoff? Well, he needs to get 50% plus one. And in the early returns, without Orleans, Baton Rouge, and Shreveport, he's got 53.1%. If you add Orleans, East Baton Rouge, and Shreveport into this mix, he would not have that he'd have less than 50%. Okay, so there are- And, and Sean Wilson would be in the, probably in the mid to high 20s. And mm -hmm. that's, that's what we're gonna be watching throughout the yes, night. maybe Thank even you. above 30%. Thank you for that perspective. And now we wanna go back over to Sharice. All right, thanks so much. Uh, as we wanna go ahead and get through those numbers, and we know that we just saw that uh, Clancy mm -hmm. Dubos, our political analyst, ran through them, but we wanna put them uh, on your screen uh, right now. Take a look, if in case you missed it, Jeff Landry, no surprise here, 53% of the votes so far. Sean Wilson, 23%, uh, and John Schroeder at 7%, and Stephen Wagaspak at 6%. Obviously, no big surprises here, but those precincts are just starting to really return here. Uh, so of course, as Clancy just mentioned, and the big question is, will Jeff Landry continue to get 50%, 50 plus one of that vote? We want to go to Whitney Miller. She is joining us now live from Sean Wilson's election night headquarters. And Whitney, Sean is in, uh, is in New Orleans. He's from the West Bank area, and uh, he has been really pushing hard across the state. He has, Sharice. We are here at the Westin. Uh, behind behind the cameras are the people. All of his supporters are here. Uh, and they're mingling amongst each other, talking about Sean Wilson. The excitement is high here tonight. I have a guest here with me, Senator Duplessis, talking about Sean Wilson. Yeah. Uh, you are supporting him. Tell us, what was your main reason for supporting Sean? Well, serving in the state legislature for the past five years, I've had the privilege of working in close collaboration with Dr. Wilson when he was head of the Department of Transportation. So working literally on trying to invest in building roads and bridges, seeing what kind of leader he was, seeing how dedicated he was, how smart he is. Uh, and this is truly a man that I've always been impressed with. So when he made the decision to run for governor, it was a no brainer for me to support him. And we were just talking about the campaign ads that come on and his mother is on there. And she's talking about how we here in the state of Louisiana haven't had a black governor for over 100 years. Um, what would that mean if Sean Wilson was made governor for the state of Louisiana? Well, in a state that is 33% African American, I think it would mean a great deal. But I just want to stress the point that he's not just the black candidate. He's the most qualified candidate. He is by far the most qualified candidate. His experience, his intellect, his character, uh, his, his record of service. So in addition to that, him being the first black governor in the state of Louisiana since Reconstruction in over 100 years would mean a great thing. And it's time. And like Mama Wilson said in the commercial, why not Sean? There's no real good reason why not. Uh, he'd be excellent for this state. And, you know, we've been watching here, only a few precincts reporting right now. Um, he looks in a good position. We were talking about the path forward. What does the path forward look like for him? Well, the path forward is just to get through tonight. You know, obviously we want to make it to a runoff. And then hopefully all the voters across this state will focus in on the importance of this race. And we look at the path that was implemented just four years ago when they said Governor John Bell Edwards couldn't be reelected, let alone when he was elected the first time eight years ago when they said a Democrat couldn't win statewide. So we know that there's a pathway, we know that there's a framework, and we make it to the runoff, and then we focus on getting people excited going into November. All right.
right, Senator, thank you so much for your time. And we'll send it back to you, Cherise. Again, the party is getting started out here at the Westin, and we are having a good time, but um, we'll be checking in throughout the night. I'll send it back to you. All right, I'm sure we'll be checking in very often. Uh, everyone, it is very early on in the night, so we have a lot of election results to get through. So we'll continue to monitor these results. In the meantime, be sure to go to www.ltv.com. We have updates there as well. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, more election results in campaign 2023. Welcome back to our election 2023 coverage. Of course, we have a governor's race up for grabs tonight, not to mention a number of local and statewide elections. We're keeping very close tabs on all of them for you as those results start to come in. And I am here with three of the greatest political minds in the state of Louisiana. Eyewitness News political analyst Clancy Dubos, Ron Fauche, and Dr. Silas Lee. Doctors, both of you. Uh, not, to, not to under credit you, Ron. Uh, but we wanted to talk about the lieutenant governor's race because Billy Nungesser, obviously an incumbent running in that race. There was talk he was going to run for governor. Yeah. He decided not to do that, and we're ready to call this race. Yes, Billy Nungesser was a clear winner in the early voting. He gets 69%, and frankly, I should have called that sooner because that was obvious. He had uh, five opponents. The closest one to him got less than 20%, but he's in the early vote, he gets 69%, and he was always expected to run away with that race, and it looks like he's going to do that. All right, so Clancy Dubo's calling the race for lieutenant governor to Billy Nungesser, the incumbent tonight. It's the first one of many that we're going to be calling as we continue yes. our election coverage tonight. We are talking about, of course, the gubernatorial election, and that is the hot race tonight that everybody's really keeping the closest eye on. However, there is a lot of interest out there. We just were over at the Sean Wilson camp. Of course, he is a black candidate. He's the Democratic candidate running for governor. And historically, it's been difficult for black candidates to win statewide. Dr. Lee, uh, this is something that has interested you. Why do you think it is? Why do we have such a hard time electing a black candidate statewide? A couple of reasons. One, funding is a major issue. Lack of resources. Then the ability to crack this polarized electoral environment that we are in, in terms of um, voters having racialized voting patterns, also on the issue on region as well as social class and issues. And it's difficult f in the sense that in this state, we have majority Democrats, but they are not strong Democrats. So a lot of people, one, are going to register as independents. Two, 
two, it's a question of galvanizing support, to, uh, getting crossover support among independents and white voters, cracking 20% or more, and more than anything, developing a coalition, urban, rural, by gender, north and south, is difficult sometimes if you do not have the resources and a base to run from. So we've seen in the past where we had Bill Jefferson run, mm -hmm. also had Cleo Fields run, they both had a political base, difference in terms of voting population. Now some people look at the model and what's happening in Georgia, and also Florida and Texas. Georgia is not only a purple state in the sense that it supported Biden over Trump, and they have two Democratic members of Congress, U.S. Senators. That is a big shift. A big shift, and that is due to in-migration. The, the population growth in Georgia is about 15 percent, and in the past 10 years they have registered one million new voters, in particular voters from California, New York, Illinois, and the Midwest. They have changed the political climate in terms of the prioritization of issues hmm. in Georgia. Yep. And we can also see some changes. Look at South Carolina, Tim Scott, elected statewide. So we can see some shifts, and that, that is directly tied to how people see themselves in reference to quality of life issues in these respective states. And that's something as the results come in, we could delve into a little bit more. Yeah, that's a really interesting issue. And of course, race always plays a, a role in our elections. We uh, talk uh, about it a lot. Sil Silas, you nailed it on that. I wouldn't change a word, but I would only add that, mm -hmm. you know, you look at the difference in the education levels between yes. Georgia and Louisiana. Georgia has a much higher percentage of college graduates among white voters who are the most likely to cross over and vote for a candidate who doesn't look like them yes. uh, and uh, Georgia also has uh, among the two Democrats in the Senate one of them is African-American and uh, you know Georgia just has a different economy different socioeconomic demographic and the, the suburban vote is a lot more moderate uh, suburban Atlanta is a lot more moderate and more likely to cross over uh, than say Jefferson Parish and St. Tammany you, you know you mentioned suburban vote in Georgia also in Texas the suburban areas are basically in large metroplexes mm -hmm. in Texas you basically have seven states in the state of Texas with these various regions mm -hmm. between the north south midwest and so forth so a lot of this is tied to the quality of life perceptions opportunities and something that we must look for in the runoff, how voters are t uh, receive and the candidates articulate a vision for this state and how voters will be receptive to that vision. This is a different campaign environment. It certainly is. I this, mean, is this is really an emotional democracy we are in, huh. where voters vote based on experiences and how they think they are of value, not just what a candidate is saying. Yeah, the nationalization, I yeah, think. Right, and, and, and party, of course, is extremely important. Yes. Okay. I mean, I would generally think Louisiana would more likely have a, an, a Republican African-American governor before it has a Democratic African-American governor just because it's easier to elect Republican governors right. in the state. And, and the other thing I would point out too is not only have, has Louisiana not had a black governor since Reconstruction times in 1873, but we haven't had black elected officials in other statewide positions mm -hmm. like you know, Attorney General, Treasurer, Secretary of State, all these other positions. And, uh, and it's certainly past time that, that you don't have more competition in, in, in these offices uh, from black candidates. I agree with Ryan. I think Louisiana, as Silas pointed out uh, about South Carolina, mm -hmm. I think Louisiana is more like South Carolina in terms of, it, which Tim Scott is a Republican. He's a Republican U.S. Mm -hmm. Senator, African American from South Carolina. I could see Louisiana electing a Republican African American, but what, which, what, I'm gonna look, what I want to think about and ask Ryan to talk about and Silas too, do you think here in Louisiana, if we have a runoff between Republican Jeff Landry and Democrat Sean Wilson, which is likely, right. w do you think that now Jeff Landry will debate? 
Well, he would have, one, I would <laughs> hope he would. Because now it's just down to two. Because the pressure would be on him it to really debate. Would. And if he doesn't show for de a debate, it would not look good because voters want to see and hear his policy positions. They want to hear and feel a level of accountability. Therefore, the best way to do that is to engage. You have to engage with voters. Does it matter? And that's though? been missing. Does it matter? I mean, well, you know, yeah. that well, it doesn't I mean, look good, you know? He's going to be way ahead yeah. if, right. if, if those two are in the race. And I would guess he would do what he did in the primary. And that is do one major debate and then not do the other ones. Mm -hmm. And he figures that if I don't debate, uh, less chances less for chances, error. Right. Sure. Because think about it, a debate serves the purpose of either correcting a vision or capturing a mistake on camera. Hmm. And you look for that opportunity to have that gotcha moment with your opponent. Right. If that yep. doesn't happen, well, we're back to the drawing board. That's right. And it's, very hard, it's very hard to win debates. Yeah. Uh, anybody can lose them, yeah. but it's hard to win them. That's but I'll point. tell you what, based upon what we've seen, to back up Ron's point, I agree. I think Jeff Landry will commit to one debate, and that will be it. And it'll be on a Friday night, so everybody watching high school football or whatever. <laughs> and uh, because if you watched any of the debates that we did have, Sean Wilson is an excellent debater. Yes, He's yes. deep in the weeds on policy. He knows policy. Jeff Landry is not that deep on policy. He does talking points. He talks about crime, and that's about it. And I think that's what we're going to see. He's going to get on in one debate, talk about crime, and then do everything. He's going to hide from the cameras for the rest of the runoff. All right, well, we're going to have to wait and see. But, gentlemen, we're going to take a quick break. But sure. we want to hear much more of your expert political anal analysis. You can see we have the latest numbers on the screen for you right now at home. 215 of 3,929 precincts. Jeff down. Landry winning right now with 47% of the vote. Sean Wilson second with 28.8. We will see if those numbers change and what the trends are and continue tracking them with our election analysts after this short break.
Welcome back. We continue to watch one of the really closely and top contests that's happening right now in the state of Louisiana. The governor's race. I want to give you an updated look at the numbers as the precincts start to come in right now. But it looks like Jeff Landry continues to remain in the lead. This is something that is not a surprise. They are leading in the polls 48.1% with Sean Wilson following behind with 28.3%. I want to go out to Paul Murphy. He's live for us in Broussard. This is where uh, Jeff Landry and his family lives. Their election night headquarters is out there tonight and Paul, you're being joined by uh, GOP Chair Paul Gurbich. Yes, uh, Cherie, we are at the uh, ballroom in Broussard. It's a suburb of Lafayette at the Jeff Landry watch party tonight. A lot of Republican leaders, a lot of state Republican leaders here tonight. One of them, Louis Gurbich, who is the chair of the Louisiana Republican Party. And Louis, how, how are you handicapping it tonight? It looks like uh, Jeff Landry uh, is, is uh, out ahead uh, by a pretty good margin. The numbers are too early to really have. Technical issues there uh, with Lewis Garbage. We're going to talk to him in just a little while, but we want to go back over here with our election analysts as we start to see those numbers coming in for governor. Clancy Dubos is standing by at the map uh, with the latest on Baton Rouge and some other areas that we're starting to see, which obviously are key players, Clancy. Uh, you're absolutely right, Katie. And as we said just a few minutes ago, once we get the early votes in from Orleans and Baton Rouge and Shreveport, what do you see? Sean, they're green. That means Sean Wilson ran first in those. And as we projected a few minutes ago, Jeff Landry fell below 50%. Sean Wilson jumped up to the high 20s. And as the night wears on, these numbers are going to become not necessarily set in stone, but they're going to look more like this than they did earlier. And we can project already, I think, that Jeff Landry and Sean Wilson will be in a runoff. Uh, unless Landry can somehow on election day pull even more, which is possible. It's mathematically possible, but based upon this nearly complete, there are only two parishes out. Monroe, which is Washita Parish, which has a high percentage of African-American vote, and Allen Parish, which has relatively few votes of either blacks or whites. So when Monroe comes in, it's probably gonna reinforce what we have here. Again, that's early voting plus early returns from uh, election uh, voting today. Let's take a quick look at two other important races. An attorney general, Liz Morrow looking a lot like Jeff Landry in that she worked for him. Uh, she was his top, one of his top aides, and she's doing very well uh, uh, in Jeff Landry strongholds. Lindsey Cheek is the only major Democrat in this race, and she too is running strong in Baton Rouge, some of the river parishes in New Orleans where Democrats would, you would expect Democrats would run well. John Stefanski, another Republican, who is challenging Morrill on the Republican side, but as you can see, Morrill's got 43 plus percent of the votes, Stefanski's got a little over 17 percent. Again, most of this is early voting, but it looks like there's going to be a runoff between Morrill and probably Lindsey Cheek, but it's not out of the question that Stefanski could move up. The other two candidates are not really making much of an impact other than making sure there's a runoff. Let's look now at Secretary of State, a very important contest because the Secretary of State is the state's chief elections officer. And here it looks like we're definitely going to have a runoff. And now the map is more multicolored because you have two Democrats, Gwen Collins Greenup and Arthur Morell. They're splitting the, the, the Democratic vote. Both happen to also be African American. And you've got three Republicans in the middle. And right now it's Collins Greenup and Nancy Landry, who was the first assistant state attorney, I'm sorry, first assistant secretary of state, uh, who's been doing a lot of the work for that office. And as she's been saying, you know, I'm the most qualified because I've actually done the job. But right behind her is Republican uh, Speaker of the House, Clay Shexton and Mike Francis uh, from the Lafayette area, another Republican who was at one time chairman of the Republican Party in Louisiana. So you've got Democrat, Republican, 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 and Democrat all bunched together between 12 and 21 percent of the vote. Uh, Gwen Collins Greenup, I should point out, ran for this office twice before and at least one of those times made it to the runoff. So I would not be surprised to see her run first or second, make it to the runoff with either Nancy Landry or Clay Shack Snyder. But again, this is mostly early votes, but when you look at now you have Monroe in, and when you see this map missing only one relatively small, not very highly populated parish, the early vote gives you an idea of what it's going to look like. Let's quickly go right back to governors now that we got Monroe in. 
And you can see again, Sean Wilson and Jeff Landry, 48.1, 28.4 for Wilson. And by the end of the night, the map was going to look very much like this. It's just a question of whether Landry can get above 50% plus one. And that's what we'll be watching as the night wears on. All right. Now, Ron, you wanted to add something to the Secretary of State's race. Right. Well, one of the things about the, the statewide races below governor is I've never seen a governor's election in Louisiana where more voters uh, knew so little about the candidates. They were very frustrated about that because they say, you know, we have to vote for all these offices. A lot of them are open. Uh, they're important for the state. And we've never heard of the candidates. Mm -hmm. I've had, you know, it's rare that you see that. And, and one other thing I would point out, we're, we're a little before 9 p.m. And, and I think the governor's race has now taken shape. Okay. I think this is where it's roughly going to go. It's going to move around, but it's basically Shake shake. All right, it's go time. And we want to get over to Sharice because we have some more from the campaign headquarters. Yeah, we want to actually get back out to Paul Murphy. I know we had some audio issues a little bit earlier, but Paul Murphy is joining us now live from Broussard's at Landry's election night headquarters. Paul. Sharice, yeah, we are here with Lewis Gurbich, who is the chair of the Louisiana Republican Party. And we're talking about what, how, how you handicap in this race tonight, the, uh, the uh, governor's race. You mean in terms of whether we'll win it outright tonight? Well, the numbers are still coming in. It's very, very early. I think Jeff has a legitimate shot at winning it outright. But if we go into overtime, that is the runoff, things will be fine. I think he's going to establish a substantial lead. He's been the right candidate. He's a fierce campaigner, a great conservative. And I think things, whether we finish it tonight or on November 18th, I think I know where this is headed, as do most Louisianans. Now, the state party made the, the pretty unusual a step of endorsing Jeff early before we knew who was going to be in the race. That didn't sit well, of course, with the other Republican candidates in the race. Maybe just explain the thinking there. The thinking's very simple. That we did not want to reprise what happened in 2015 and 2019, where the candidates uh, basically ate each other up. And so we did everything we could to narrow down the field, which I think we did. We didn't narrow it down completely. But we weighed in. I think this is a telling effect on what's happening tonight. And I think that we're going to have a result that's obviously totally at odds with what happened in 2015 and 2019. How would you describe Jeff Landry's politics? All right, unfortunately, continuing to have audio issues there, but don't worry, we have all of the numbers right here in our studios and on our website, www.tv.com. Just giving you another look at the numbers, the governor's race continuing to take shape as the precincts start to report in. It looks like Jeff Landry continues to lead in that race 48% right now. Sean Wilson with 28%, of course, followed by Stephen Wagesback, 7%, and John Schroeder, 6%. And of course, as these numbers start to come in, we start to see what the this really could turn out to be. Could Jeff Landry get over 50%, 50 plus one of the vote? We continue to an, uh, talk to our an anal analyst and look at the numbers on our website, wwltv.com. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with more coverage.
Welcome back, everybody, and thanks for joining us on this election night. Of course, we're hotly watching the governor's race, but there are a lot more uh, contentious election results that we are starting to see, especially over in Jefferson Parish. So let's talk to our uh, panel of esteemed colleagues as we take a look at these numbers. Jennifer Van Vranken uh, in Jefferson Parish running at large against Ricky Template. We also, you can see there, those are the initial returns, 39% already reporting in JP. Uh, so that is a significant slug of votes where I think we can, you know, start to draw some conclusions pretty soon. Well, it really depends on how many of those uh, votes are coming from Kenner and the West Bank, because that's where a template would, would run well. If they are representative of the parish as a whole, like a, a poll would be, mm -hmm. then we could project it. But uh, because it's still relatively close, I think Van Franklin is likely to win that race. And this is what some of the polls were showing. Uh, but, you know, the turnout is, a, is a, uh, on, on election day, it's all about the ground game. Yep. And, you know, that's where Template might have an edge, but I don't know if he has enough of an edge to overcome the early lead in the polls that Van Franken had. But it's really a, a West Bank, East Bank yes. uh, battle, and we don't really know. Uh, at this point yet wh where the votes are coming from. Okay, yeah. that's going to be interesting to watch. Let's take a look at the other at-large seats. Scott Walker, mm. the incumbent, incumbent in this race. This mm. really has been a slugfest between these two. This I has think been... we can call this one right now. Mm. You can, You do? Yes, I'm actually, yeah, yeah we have hey, 40% fan. of the vote in and a, and a spread that large because Walker was always ahead in the polls and he was always ahead by a significant number. We can put a check mark next to Scott Walker. He's gonna win that race. All right, we have Clancy Dubos calling the race for Scott Walker in the Jefferson Parish Council at large race. That has had a lot of money poured into that race. So that is a hotly contested one. Yes. Are you all surprised to see those numbers at that large yeah. of a spread, Silas? Well, a couple of things. Uh, it's a 10,000 vote difference right now. And let's talk about the candidates that, not, that were not on the ballot. Sidney Torres. Mm -hmm. He also had some other political figures, but the fact that it became very personal. And for every attack, the candidates responded to it. Hmm. And so it was very contentious. But at the same time, we see with Scott Walker and Impostato, uh, that's a 10,000 vote difference. That's a significant amount of votes anytime you have 45% in now. Mm -hmm. So as we approach 50 and above, it, right now it's at a little bit more than 10. Yeah, Ron, are you surprised? <sighs> Not really, most of the polls showed Scott Walker consistently ahead by a pretty good margin. And you know, based on his first election and looking at this, uh, Scott Walker is somebody who tends to do better than the polls do. He tends to under poll, I think, sometimes. And that's a mark of a candidate who wins elections. All right, Scott Walker, Lancey projecting is the winner yeah, of the I, Jefferson Parish. It may Parish. get a little closer, but I don't see it, I don't see it ch changing in terms of who wins and who, who doesn't. Okay, we had some other parish council races in Jefferson up for grabs, mm. the District 3 race. Wow. Byron Lee and Derek Shepard, who of course, you know, was in the state legislature, had some issues. He's on the school board. Uh, he is well known in Jefferson Parish. He, he is the perpetual, you've had a perpetual motion. He's perpetual campaigning. Yes. <laughs> He's always running for something. Uh, he got into trouble. He went to jail, for on, went to federal prison for lo money laundering. Mm -hmm. Pleaded guilty to one count in connection with the uh, Bill Jefferson scandal. And he came out of jail and started running from day one. Uh, he, he ran for council, I think, last time and lost, and then he ran for the school board about a year ago and won, mm -hmm. and now he's already running for this, and I'm wondering if he's not going to turn around and run for the state senate or something else, you mm. know, to get back to Baton Rouge at some point. If he, we'll if he does not if, win tonight. If he wins or loses tonight. Mm -hmm. What are we thinking about these numbers so well, far? I, I think it's too early because 16 yeah, out is. of 44, yeah. we don't know where they are. It, 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 that, that could still go either way. When you look at it in terms of pure numbers, you're only talking about 620 votes. Uh, in a city council election, that's not enough to project. Now, if we had, you know, 79 or 80% of the precincts in, I would say, yeah, we could then call it, but I don't think we can call it yet. This is a largely West Bank district. Totally does that West play, Bank, does yeah. that play a role? Not that much, but totally. it's been very competitive. Mm -hmm. For every allegation that Lee right. or Shepard 
made to the other, mm -hmm. they responded. So it's been an extremely competitive campaign. Mm -hmm. The challenge, I think, is trying to get voters to like one of those two candidates. Oh, yeah. and, and that's, uh, they're both controversial. <laughs> yeah, I, I made a mistake. It, it does have some East Bank precincts, but it's, uh -huh. it's, it's a heavily majority black, black district. Yes. Right. And that, that is, as in Jefferson, that is the black council seat among the districts. Well, okay. what we don't know is uh, Shepard was probably leading in most African-American precincts. Lee was probably in the uh, white precinct. Co you know, running close to him there, but he was probably leading in the white precinct. So, so we don't really know which ones are in and which ones are out. So in a majority right. black district race, even playing a factor there. Absolutely. Another element that I noticed in this campaign and other campaigns, I've never seen more candidates highlight the role of their family members, especially mothers, daughters, and women. It really has been a family uh, Fam election. Right. People really focusing on it. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that women are the major influence brokers in communities and in households. They understand the dynamics of managing a house as well as negotiating policies. Mm -hmm. And they can convince and convert people to support a candidate that they like. So you notice in all of these races, Byron Lee right. and Shepard, the governor's race, they highlighted family. That's got to be a change. Major change. Yeah, yeah but also women are 55% of the electorate, right. yeah. sometimes 56%. Right. So right. it, you'd be- And among you'd the African-American yeah. electorate, it's, it's over it's 60%. Yeah, and, yeah. and especially in terms of turnout. Yeah. So the, the path to victory in any majority black city or any majority black district is through women and churches okay. and, and I, only, I would disagree with Silas on only one thing in my house there's no negotiating Marco just tells me <laughs> what to do <laughs> but other than that you're right <laughs> other than that he nailed it all right I let's know, take a look I, I gave up a long time ago. <laughs> she's uh, a wonderful woman I have she to say absolutely is. Uh, council district four let's mm. take a look at that this is of course wow. Kenner uh, Arita Bohannon Jack Rizzuto who is a common a well-known political name out there the Rizzuto name um, and then uh, Albert Morella uh, coming in third so far with of course more than half the precincts reporting what do you all think about this race that looks certainly very good for Bohannon. Uh, I think it's clear she's going to run first, and the question is, like Jeff Landry, can can she, when yeah. she can continue to stay above 50%. I think we need to see a few more precincts come in. I'd be more comfortable as we get closer to 40 out of 50, to, and if she's still at 53% then, I would say we could call that race. She's a political newcomer. No, no I wouldn't say a newcomer. She, her no? name is well known out in Kenner, and, and that's, that's where that district is based. It's mm -hmm. West Metairie and Kenner. So you guys think that this is going to continue to play out? We're going to have to see which do, which We're precincts. We're going to see a few more, then we'll be able to call that. One. Okay. All right. Okay. So that, those are the uh, first three. Then this one, District Five. Hans mm -hmm. Liljeberg, of course, we he can was call a judge. This one. Uh, yeah. Hans call this Liljeberg one. was always the favorite, and even though there's only about a third of the, pre a little more than a third of the precincts in, uh, that's a very <laughs> homogenous district. It's not like you're going to see vast differences from one end of the district to the other. So we can call that one for Hans Liljeberg, and that is no surprise. Okay, Clancy no. making another call tonight. Hans Liljeberg, the winner in the District 5 race for the council. That's Jennifer Van Branken's former district, and she's, of course, now running at large, winning right now, as at least at the moment, as we have about half the Jefferson Parish precincts coming in. And we're going to take a short break. We'll have much more analysis for you uh, right after this.
election 2023 coverage. Of course, the governor's race, the hot race tonight, but we also have a lot of other issues on the ballot that Louisiana voters uh, decided tonight. And we are about ready with our group of esteemed analysts here at WWL to call those amendment races. There were some constitutional amendments on the ballot. Let's take a look at the numbers and go through those. And then you all are ready to call these. Right. We're going to uh, call all of them. With and these all numbers. Pass. We'll start with the number one, which is uh, no private funding for elections. Uh, this is a so-called anti-Zuckerbucks amendment. Uh, number two, the freedom of worship. This was the uh, right to go to church. Right. Well, it's during it was it was the anti-COVID uh, restrictions. regulations restrictions about going to church. Uh, the issue was already decided by the courts, but they want to put it in the con in the Constitution anyway. It passes by a big margin. Number three was uh, the, the retirement system putting a, a dedicating a, a higher percentage of surplus funds toward ret uh, retiring debt, uh, a retirement system debt. That's passing pretty handily, and it looks right. like it's going to pass statewide as well. Uh, continue to All pass. Right. And then the last Let one, me divided property. Sorry, I'm going to jump in for a quick second for you, Clancy. It looks like we have Steve Scalise oh, speaking right now at Drago's. Let's take a live listen in. No better place to be than Drago's. Uh, let me first tell you, there is no greater honor I have than representing Southeast Louisiana in Congress. Thank you all for that opportunity. Uh, God has been great. Health is doing really well. Thank you for the prayers. LSU is destroying Auburn, as we can see. But tonight, tonight we're here to talk about the future of the great state of Louisiana. And it's going to be a great future. There are some really good things happening as you're watching results. We've got uh, two candidates here that are going to be celebrating some things. To the Liljeburg campaign, Hans, all of his extended family. I know that they're, they're going to be making an announcement shortly, so I won't jump on that. But I'm so proud to know and support Hans and all that he's done over the years, serving on the bench with great honor. But uh, big things ahead of you on the Jefferson Parish Council. That'll. That'll go on, but let me tell you about somebody who I've known really since I was a state representative, uh, was introduced to him. He became my legislative assistant, uh, when you only had one staffer, by the way, when I was a state rep. And then Cameron decided to take on leadership of his own, ran for the state legislature, did a phenomenal job there, built great coalitions there got many achievements in the state legislature, and ultimately got elected to the state Senate, and has been doing such great things in the Senate, there's bigger things ahead. But tonight, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, the voters of Senate District 9 have overwhelmingly reelected Cameron Henry to the state Senate. And I want to bring up my senator, your senator, Cameron Henry, come on up. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Ooh, is this all right? Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, it, you all have no idea how great of an honor it is just to have him up here with me after everything that's going on in D.C. and just to have him back here with his health. That's awesome. One more round of applause for the man for being here. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm honored to serve uh, Senate District 9 for four more years. Uh, the campaign was an entertaining campaign. Uh, a lot of people I need to thank. Uh, there's no special order. Uh, I don't know whether Dee Dee Lancaster is here, but she ran my campaign. I don't even know whether she's here. Uh, but, but fantastic job. If you ever need a great person to take care of your campaign, Dee Dee is it. Uh, Greg Rigamer helped me out with my numbers. He's on TV all over the place right now, so we're happy with him. Uh, but I mean, all this begins and ends uh, with my wife, Jamie. Um, where is she? So I don't get to stand here for this next four-year term or the previous four-year terms or the previous 12 years after that without Jamie. Um, she's been very understanding for all the work that we have to put in for this. Uh, it's a lot more miserable than you all would think. But we get to do some of the fun things, and they get to do, Jamie gets to do a lot of the, I would say, not, much, not as many enjoyable things as we get to do, let's put it that way. So without it, I'm, I'm very grateful and blessed that she's been able to help me through this. We've got a few more years ahead of us, uh, election-wise and campaign-wise, but been a great time so I want to just publicly make sure everybody knows that she's done a fantastic job for us all so we thank you very much 
Um, love you very much. Ideal. Wonderful. Um, obviously, my kids are enjoying this more than anyone else on the planet. Uh, all the experiences they've had, they have more fun doing this than anything else. So uh, they've been very patient, and they promised, I promised I wasn't going to speak long to make sure that they didn't want to stand here any longer than they needed to. So I promise you I'm going to keep that true. Uh, obviously, my mom is here. I'd like to tell her thank you. Uh, very, very grateful for that. I have my, my brother, Kathy and Carol, my sisters. I have my nieces and nephews. I have Joe and Al. I have Mooney here, Gigi is here somewhere. Uh, the whole family, Alex, it's, I'm just very blessed for everyone to be here, it's, it's awesome. It really is wonderful, I, 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 there's not enough, I, I don't wanna, I can stay up here all day. Um, Regina Barrow, where are you? Did she leave? One of my colleagues, where's Regina? Over there in the corner. Regina Barrow drove all the way in from Baton Rouge to tell me hello, please everyone get to know her. She has great, she has a great future in the Senate. Look, everyone, I, I want to thank you all for coming. I now have the pleasure to introduce one of an old dear friend of mine who I first met, where is he, who I first met when he had two daughters. That's how I explained my relationship with Hans. I first met him when he had two daughters. Now he has seven. And that's how long we have been friends. Uh, we went through the judgeship together, which he, which he did a fantastic job with. We expect greater things now as a councilman. Uh, so as he makes his way up here, my family's going to step off and his entire family is going to come up on stage and they, we're all going to have to get off of them to fit. Uh, come on up here, Hans. <laughs> Councilman-elect, folks. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you, Steve. I am. I am. I'm. I'm flattered and floored by the amount of support. I know y'all all came to see me and not Steve and Cameron. I, w I was really worried about Cameron winning tonight and. Thank God, you know, he made it, he pulled it through, he made it. I, I can't tell y'all how sincerely I appreciate y'all being here. All, All right. right, that of course is Parish Councilman-elect Hans Liljeburg. We've called that race for him. Cameron Henry up there in the state Senate that was there just a few moments ago. That race appears to be going in his favor. Our panel of analysts say that is a significant race, not only because we just heard Steve Scalise at home for the first time after his quest for the Speaker of the House and his decision to step aside from that. So we heard from Scalise. We saw him in person in Drago's and Metairie. Of course, Cameron Henry used to work for him, but it's also significant for another reason, and that is that Clancy and our analysts say it's very likely he will be the next Senate president. Yeah, he's been campaigning for that behind the scenes and out in front among his colleagues in the Senate, and he is the odds-on favorite to become the next Senate president, which is very significant for Orleans Parish because you know, and Jefferson Parish, Jefferson. because he, he's pri primarily in Jefferson, but he has a, a few precincts in uptown New Orleans. So he has parts of both parishes, and it's important for the whole metropolitan area to have someone in that position of power representing this area, because we saw in the last four years, Lafayette got it all, because mm -hmm. that's where the Senate president was from. Mm -hmm. This will swing things back, either at least to balance things out, if not to help out things in Jefferson and Orleans. From our John Alario days, we don't have John Alario up there anymore, right. and so, right. you know. Now we got Cameron Henry, if, if, assuming he becomes parish, uh, rather, Senate president. Senate. And do you all think that's significant as well? Well, yes, without a doubt. Anytime you have someone in that position who can influence, policies, issue prioritization, resources, it makes a difference. Money. The budget starts Money. in the House, but it ends up in the Senate. Okay. All right. We do have some other races that we're watching very closely in the legislature. There have been several hot buttons. The race with Pat Connick, the incumbent. But we would do want to first get through these amendments because we started to call these right before we went to right. Steve Scalise. Amendment 4, blighted property. This is an amendment that takes away, or rather it allows local governments like City Council in New Orleans, mm -hmm. which is the driver of this, 
to remove the property tax exemption of a uh, nonprofit entity if they operate property that is blighted and continues to be blighted and they refuse to upgrade it, they can remove their property tax exemption and that's passing overwhelmingly. And that's a good thing. All right. Now, of course, we've had a lot of, of these uh, parish council races. We are now apparently hearing from Scott Walker, who we called his race we have a little while ago, so let's listen in. still decide elections. People in Jefferson Parish, real people, decide elections. And that is who I'm here for. We ran a very positive campaign which is what I said we were gonna do from day one. We were not gonna get dirty, we were not gonna get into the weeds, we were gonna be positive, and we were gonna talk about me and what I've done over the past four years. Unfortunately, on the other side, there were lies, there, were, there was deception, there was misinformation that proliferated throughout this parish. And it's frustrating, but we didn't say a word. And there's a lot more I'd like to say tonight that I'm not because we're gonna to continue to be positive and we're gonna to continue to do what we've done for the past four years and for the people of Jefferson Parish. All right, so Scott Walker so hearing from him for the first time, reelected as the incumbent at large. You know, it was a shock whenever he first won last year because he was taking on some pretty uh, political heavyweights in Jefferson yeah. Parish, and now he has been reelected after a very tough campaign. And you know what, if we could, I don't know if we can, but if we could pull up the results of the other at large race, the Van Jennifer Franken Van race Franken versus uh, Ricky Template, because Scott Walker ran as one of the independents and Van Franken was also one of the independents in the sense that they're all Republicans, but uh, Van Franken and Walker ran without the, the majority of the political establishment mm -hmm. or the machine, as some people would call it. Uh -huh. And here you see Van Franken, 54%. This now I think we can call. I think she's going to win this race because you've got, looks like about 75 to 80 percent of the vote in. And what's out is probably equally proportionate from the east and west bank, which means it's going to play out pretty much the way you see right there. It was a closely contested race. It wasn't as ugly, it wasn't nearly as ugly as the Scott Walker, Dominic and Pastata race. Mm -hmm. But in both of those races, the losing candidate was the candidate of Greg Busan, who was the target of the attacks by Sidney Torres as the orchestrator, alleged orchestrator and, and marionette, uh, if you will, mm -hmm. of, of the, the, the power players in Jefferson Parish and the power broker. And it looks like it's a, a bad night for him, at least on the council races. Uh, but he's a guy, he's, he's a very well-known and well-established political consultant, handles dozens of candidates yes. in almost every election cycle, but he was targeted by Sidney Torres and it's kind of a little uh, inter-parish inter war out in Kenner, mm -hmm. but it spread out parish-wide here. Over trash. And, it, and so it looks like the uh, the independent candidates did very well. Also, the former TV anchors did very the well. The TV anchors <laughs> are winning tonight. <laughs> and I'm winning tonight with this panel of, of analysts that I have with me. We're going to, of course, have a lot more uh, political analysis from them as the night wears on. And as we are continuing to call some of these big races, we're really starting to get a big chunk of those votes in. So we're starting to really see some movement in terms of being able to call those races and have some really definitive answers for you at home tonight. Uh, so we're going to... Uh, of course, continue to have that. Now, let's talk a little bit more about those uh, legislative races. Mandy Landry, one of the incumbents that's running. We have Pat Connick running, also another incumbent. We're closely watching those races yes. because they have been pretty hotly contested, but the results so far, what are you all seeing? I'm looking at my screen for the latest, and uh, Pat Connick is a state senator mm -hmm. on the West Bank. Yes. He succeeded John Alario. He served one term so far. He's up for a second term. Very hotly contested race, very much like the uh, uh, Dominic Impostata, Scott Walker race, mm -hmm. but in this case, Pat Connick, who has most of the uh, establishment support, including his, his media consultant, Greg Busan, doing very well there. With 57 of 75 precincts, I think we can project that Pat Connick is going to win re-election. Okay, that's another call from Clancy Dubos that we're bringing you right here on Channel 4. Now we want to go back over to Sharice. All right, thanks so much, guys. Uh, Mick Ferris is joining us now live from Drago. She's speaking with Congressman Steve Scalise, obviously very important because this is the first time we have seen Scalise back home, that is, since he dropped his bid for Republican House Speaker. We're going to go over to Meg. She's at Drago's and Meg that he was there for Hans Liljeberg and Cameron Henry. That's correct, Sharice, and he just gave a speech and he has agreed to talk to us right now. Congressman Steve Scalise, thank you so much. I know you're a busy man right now. Um, you finally got in town after a whirlwind week. Yeah, it's been quite a week last really 
couple of weeks, but you know, getting home last night and and just being amongst friends here who have been wonderful throughout this. You know, obviously we've been focused on dealing with things that are still ongoing in D.C., but uh, it's always great to come back home and be around the people who who elected me to Congress, who I'm honored to represent. And Tommy Satanovich, who owns Drago's, he flew out there as well as some other people, thinking you were going to be elected as Speaker of the House and then came back. Why, do you, why was it that you got 113 vo votes and couldn't get to that 217 number? You know, our number continued to grow throughout the week. We, you know, we'd actually grown a pretty strong number, but there were about 20 members that still weren't there. And, you know, when you need 218 on the House floor, uh, and you don't have a real margin. We, you know, we weren't quite at the number, so you know things were going well. They kept getting better, but you know we hit a wall. We looked at a lot of things, and as you can tell, even today, uh, you know there's still those same kind of impediments. So we have a, you know, a lot of internal issues that we got to work out within our conference that are still being worked out. You know, but one of the things I said is, if it's not going to be there for me, I didn't do this for the title. Uh, I'm not going to be the reason that we don't get our house back open again. We've got to get Congress function again. You know, I've been working with a lot of our committee chairmen. We have a resolution ready to go in strong support of Israel. During that interim, when I was the speaker designee, I was talking to some of our world leaders. I talked to the ambassador of Israel about very specific needs that they have right now. Iron Dome missile replenishment, some very targeted uh, missile guidance systems that we have that we need to get them that we can't with Congress not in action. And so it's much bigger than me or anybody else. I said, I'm not going to be an impediment to getting this done. We've got to get Congress back open because there is so much at stake. And there's a, another temporary shutdown looming as well. Um, do you think, we, we see you get up there and give a strong speech and looking wonderful, but do you think some people were concerned about the health problems that you were going through or the health battle you're fighting right now? I know there was a lot of genuine concern and I shared that with my colleagues and wonderful love and outpouring of support as I was diagnosed with cancer about two months ago. I've got a wonderful team here in New Orleans, been working with other doctors as well, some of the world leaders, all are in agreement that what we, you know, there's some really good chemotherapy treatments for myeloma. It's a blood cancer. Uh, there have been remarkable breakthroughs, and I've been blessed by God to, to be able to uh, quickly get on drugs that are available for people with my form of cancer, and it's working. It's knocked out almost all of the cancer, and they've actually reduced the amount of time I need to be on chemotherapy. Uh, but we're not going to slow down on that. My health's been better than it's ever been in months. They finally found out what was wrong with me, and it's being treated. That's wonderful, Steve. What do you think it will take uh, to not go through 15 votes like it did for former Speaker McCarthy? What do you think it will take for the uh, Republican majority, which is just majority by a few people, what will it take to bring them together and elect someone? Yeah, we still only have a three-seat majority, so clearly uh, every thread of a needle can collapse any coalition. And so I've been talking to a lot of members over the last few days. I still get a lot of members texting me that we're not only part of my team but weren't there, that you know, we're trying to work through how to get there so we can resolve this quickly, hopefully in the next few days when we come back Monday. Uh, I'm still the majority leader of the House. That's not changing. So that means I still am directly involved in putting a lot of those coalitions together. So I've been having those conversations. You know, even when I got out of the speaker's race, still working to try to help put it together so we can get Congress back open again. Again, there's much work that needs to be done in Washington, and I'll be at the heart of it. We're doing a lot of planning right now for when we get this resolved, hopefully in the next few days. What is the holdout? There's a small majority that says the country is broke, we're spending too much, and, and they're, they're tired of deficit spending. And Has that been the main holdout of people who want someone who's strong and uh, enough on the economy, economy and not going to have a budget that still goes over the amount there is to spend? Well, I share those concerns, and in fact, we've been pushing for those kind of reforms. But you do have a small core of people that only want their person. You know, and if, if it's, again, the perfection, it's if it's not my guy, I'm not going to vote for anybody else, that is where the wall was hit. And that wall still is there right now, by the way, and so we've got to break through it. And I think we will in the next few days. What will it take to bring everyone together, do you think? Well, it's going to take more work. Clearly, we're not there, but we're getting closer. We were able to narrow the gap a lot, but ultimately we still have work to do. And, and again, I think we'll do it in the next few days. 
did former President Trump's endorsement of the person running against you, the Senator, uh, the uh, Congressman from Ohio, did that make a difference? Actually, no. It, it moved some more votes my way. It didn't change any votes for him. You know, the president called me, said he still, you know, appreciates what I stand for, but it didn't move any votes in the race. This is a member to member decision, and the conversations that we're having one on one. Uh, we ultimately won a majority. I got 53% of the vote to Jim Jordan's 47, uh, and then grew that vote uh, even wider, still hit a wall in the end. Very proud of how we did it. We did it with integrity, never cut any deals. And my, my colleagues really appreciate that too, because you know we got in some problems over the last nine months because of some of the deals that were cut behind closed doors that never were gonna be able to be fulfilled. And, and ultimately it bogged down other things we need to do. We gotta get back on track. There's big, big work that needs to be done. Coming back to Louisiana, you've endorsed gubernatorial candidates. Are you gonna go up to the other campaigns for some of the statewide races tonight? I spoke to Jeff Landry last night, really proud of the campaign he's run. He's leading the way. I know it's close to 50. Getting 50 in a primary in this big of a field is almost impossible, but Jeff's run a great race and will be the leading candidate one way or the other by far. Uh, and Jeff's got a great plan to turn our state around. We talk about it a lot. I served with him in Congress, so I know the kind of fighter he is. Um, our state really has to round a corner because we're losing people. We're losing really good young people, and we have too much to offer as a state. So clearly tonight's about Louisiana turning a page. You got a lot of great leaders. I think we're going to, again, with Jeff Landry ultimately getting elected governor. Cameron, of course, I've got to watch grow into a great leader in the Senate. Uh, I'm proud that he won re-election. There's bigger things ahead for him and others. And uh, it's an exciting time for Louisiana. I really think we have the chance to move our state forward in a new direction and start bringing some more young people in growing the state and replacing a lot of the people that we're losing. We, we lost a few hundred thousand people. I don't want to see that trend continue because I go to all states all around the country. There are states right now that are growing dramatically and losing population dramatically. And you're going to be one or the other. I want us to be one of the states that grows. We've got the resources. We've got the culture. We've got the strong will. Our people are the most resilient people in the world with some of the best resources. We've got to utilize it better and make that case and start growing our state. And from Jeff Landry on down, I think we're going to turn that corner. Well, you've been through a lot this year and continued health to you. Thank you so much for talking to us. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Live here from Drago's, I'll send it back to you. All right, an exclusive interview from our Meg Ferris right there. That is from Congressman Steve Scalise after he dropped his bid uh, to become Speaker of the House and got a, gave us a lot of updates as to why he made that decision. Of course, it is election night. The numbers continue to roll in. We'll have more analysis coming up for you on the Eyewitness News. Stay with us and we'll be right back.
next on Great. our election night coverage. Of course, we continue to cover the state races and the local races as well. Now, the race for uh, parish president in St. Tammany has two local political veterans, rather, excuse me, facing off with incumbent Mike Cooper facing side on Mayor Greg Cromer. We want to begin tonight with Lily Cummings, who is at Mike Cooper's campaign headquarters this evening. Sharice, good evening. Spirits are still high here in Covington. We've been watching as the crowd continues to grow. Take a look at what we're looking at here. Incumbent Mike Cooper, the Republican candidate, another Republican candidate. They're both Republican candidates. Look at him. He has a few uh, four-legged um, friends here that are on the ground beside me who are cheering him on. And of course, large crowds, good food, good music. They uh, have been keeping the LSU game on, so spirits are still high, but we haven't seen uh, Mr. Cooper come out and give any updates or anything as of right now. We know that he is up in the polls as of right now, but when you take a look at this race, ladies, you're looking at Republicans with political backgrounds and strong ties to the parish, very similar. Of course, Slido Mayor Greg Cromer told me earlier this week he's focused on forging strong relationships with the parish council. That is something that Mike Cooper has been criticized for in the past. However, whoever is the next parish president will work with a new council with at least six new faces, possibly as many as 13. That's something Parish President Mike Cooper says he's been looking forward to. Now, Cooper told us that his top priority has been infrastructure. We emphasize that again tonight as we spoke with him about uh, two hours or so now. We haven't seen uh, President Cooper in the room as of late. I'm sure he's keeping a close eye on those numbers. But again, infrastructure, his top priority. He says the development in this parish has outpaced the parish being able to keep up with things like roads, bridges, uh, sewage, drainage, those things. So those are the things that he is going to continue to be focused on as he looks to hopefully get another four years. But again, time is going to tell what those results are tonight. Again, we know that he is up in the polls right now and things are looking good. Spirits are high here so far, but I know that uh, Rachel Hanley is covering Slidell Mayor Greg Cromer's party in Slidell as well. So I'm sure we will get an update for her and how um, they're feeling over there. I hear a few cheers behind me. I think that they're cheering for some of the gubernatorial races and some of the different um, state, uh, local and state races that are going on across Louisiana. So we haven't heard a lot of uh, action here so far with results here in St. Tammany, but we will bring those to you as soon as we get them, as soon as we hear from President Mike Cooper. Reporting live in St. Tammany, Lily Cummings, Eyewitness News. All right, Lily, thank you much, so much. And as we mentioned, Cooper is facing Slidell Mayor Greg Cromer. He served as a state rep and was chairman of the insurance committee and elected mayor of Slidell in 2018. Rachel Hanley is following the returns and 
Ben Slidell joining us live now from Cromer's Election Night Headquarters. Hey, Sharice. Yeah, some people have cleared out here from the election night party in Old Town Slidell, but the atmosphere here is still very festive, even as some of the returns have come back, showing uh, incumbent parish president Mike Cooper leading uh, Slidell Mayor Greg Cromer. Now, as we've been saying all night, this was destined to be a tight race. Cromer represented a serious challenge to Mike Cooper, even though he was the incumbent. He served as Slidell Mayor. He has served as Slidell Mayor for five years, and even before that, as you said, he was a big name in St. Tammany Parish politics. He served on Slidell City Council and was council president during Hurricane Katrina. And then he served three terms in the House of Representatives. Now, as Lily was saying, Mike Cooper has had something of a contentious relationship with the parish council so far. And Greg Cromer has tried to distance himself from that by saying that one of his first priorities when he gets in is to immediately start forging good relationships with his other leaders in St. Tammany Parish. We talked to Greg Cromer right before the polls closed. Here's what he had to say. Oh, I feel great. I mean, we, uh, I'm tired. We've, we've been out in the streets all day, been uh, working for since February 22 in this campaign. The past four to six months, we really put a big press on uh, to getting in, in front of as many people as we can, any place there's folks gathered, and we get invited, we go. Uh, putting up signs, working events, you name it. We've been uh, very, very diligent and, and thorough in our campaign. We feel like we've left it all on the table tonight, and uh, we've got a, a great opportunity. Uh, the response we've been getting for the past year has been phenomenal. People are very receptive to, to change, a different attitude and a, a different perspective of, about government, and that's what we bring to the table. So we're we're comfortable, and you know, tomorrow morning I, I either wake up as the mayor of Slidell for the next two and a half years or the, the next parish president. Either way, I can't lose. And if you are elected parish president, what are your plans for your first few months in office? First thing we're going to do is just get everybody, all the players, the, the council, the parish president's office, the, the different parish agencies, all together it, to a, a place where we can communicate, open communications and, and build some team, team spirit, some confidence in each other, some trust in each other, and just the ability to, to work together and, and talk to each other. From there, then we can start to tackle the, the, the finance issues, which, which are, uh, they're, they're big. They're, they're, uh, they're not exaggerated uh, from what I've been seeing, especially with this 24 budget that's coming up, that's not exaggerated. We've got a lot of work to do. Uh, we can't do it if we're suing each other, if we're fighting, if we're arguing, but if we're together, uh, there's opportunities that we can work together to make things happen, to try to fund, I think, most, if not all, of the services and resources that are expected and deserved by our citizens. And if there was one thing that you would want voters to know, what would it be? Oh, uh, don't don't forget to vote. Just get out. If you if you haven't voted yet, get out and vote before 8 o'clock. Every vote counts. I mean, even when you don't think they count, I've, I've seen elections lost by five or seven votes, and, and you go back and you look at the, your family members and see who's voted, and you'll actually have five family members that didn't vote that could have changed the outcome of election. So go cast your vote. I know sometimes you get frustrated and, and you feel like government doesn't listen to you, but it is the, truly the only voice you have to, to get the people that represent you to respond to you. So as we've been saying, about 80% of precincts are reporting here in St. Tammany Parish, and right now, incumbent parish president Mike Cooper has the lead over Slidell Mayor Greg Cromer. We're expecting the race to be called at some point when uh, when it is. Mayor Cromer is expected to speak, so we'll bring you any updates as we get them here from Slidell. Rachel Handley, Eyewitness News. All right, Rachel, thank you. We're back with the analysts tonight. Apparently, the governor's race is really heating up. 90% of the votes in right now. Ron, you were saying that this well, could go for Landry tonight. Well, well, we've got a situation here where 91% of the precincts are in. Clancy will explain in a moment that that quite a few Orleans precincts are out, which, which is the big issue now. But at this stage of the game, um, Jeff Landry has 52.2% of the vote. There's not a lot out yet, still out, but there is enough still out to switch it and to bring him down under 50. Okay. But this has become a really, really interesting race because he is at the on the cusp right now. On the of, cusp. Of winning at 50% of the vote. Any thoughts, Dr. Lee? 
it's a waiting game right now. Yeah. And we have to wait to see where the roads are going to be coming from, especially in Orleans. I think East Baton Rouge is already in. Most of that went for, uh, for uh, Sean Wilson. Mm -hmm. But it's a waiting game anytime you have such a tight margin and over 90% in. Okay. And, and, and what, what it looks like is happening is uh, Schroeder, Wagaspak, and Lundy, who were all polling kind of between 4% and 8 and 9%, mm -hmm. they did, it looks like they did not grow at the end. If anything, they, they weakened at the end which is what gave Landry the shot at the 50%. So what we need to see is whether or not Sean Wilson can bump that percentage that exactly. he has up exactly. enough to where exactly. Jeff Landry that goes under it's and, it's, and it's going to come down to how much left in Orleans. Okay, let's get over to Clancy. Enough. Clancy's going to give us a little analysis on the map uh, and break down the numbers for us. Yeah, and as you look at the map, this is the statewide total. As, as Ron just pointed out, Jeff Landry at 52.2, Sean Wilson at 25.2. We called that order of finish hours ago but the question as we said from the get-go was can Jeff Landry get above 50 percent in the numbers that are in so far he is but what is out let's look at Orleans Parish there's only 47,682 votes in so far from Orleans Parish and that does probably I think it does include the early vote but it does not include a big swath of votes in, uh, in the rest of Orleans. And, uh, and four years ago, when Eddie Rasponi was leading at this time, and then mm -hmm. Orleans came in. It bumped it up. It bumped it up, and John mm -hmm. Bell Edwards won the election. Okay, now, well. Wilson, you can see he got 71 point, gets over 70% of the vote in Orleans. And when the rest of Orleans comes in, that's when Jeff Landry may go below 50%. You know, Orleans Parish. It's a Parish, waiting game, as Silas said. Uh, Orleans Parish mm -hmm. always keeps it interesting. But real quick, we want to go over to Jefferson Parish because Jennifer Van Branken is at the podium at speaking tonight. The winner, we declared her uh, in the Jefferson Parish Council at large race. So let's take a listen in. Um, you all have been with me every step of the way. Uh, my mom and dad, I know, are in the room. Um, and again, everything about this victory stems from them, the love and support they gave us, the educational opportunities, the hard work they instilled in us, um, even down to the colors that my mom suggested several years ago when I first entered politics. Um, so I'm so thankful, mom and dad. My husband, who has been to every civic meeting across the parish with me, every debate, um, the balcony of family who are with us, in addition, of course, to my brother, my sister, um, our whole family, the Dwyers, uh, the, my, my married family. <laughs> um, I'm so appreciative. And then um, friends and supporters who are like family to us. Um, who have been with us every step of the way. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, tonight, and I heard um, Councilman at large, Scott Walker, say this, but part of what makes this victory to me so special is that it really is about the people of Jefferson Parish. Um, when I first said that I thought the best way for me to serve was at large, and I was discouraged by the political insiders and said, well, this has already been decided. This political group and this political group um, have made that decision. My reaction was, have you checked with the voters of Jefferson Parish? Have you checked with the people of Jefferson Parish? Amen. Um, it should always come down to the people. Right. And that is who I am indebted to tonight. Um, East Bank and West Bank, voters across this parish, that is who I vow to serve. Um, and you know you will see me, as I said, at your civic meetings, at your gatherings. I want to um, bring the skills I learned as a journalist, first and foremost, to listen, to listen to people and to understand their needs, understand um, what they need you to be working on. Um, and that is what you'll get, hardworking, honesty, integrity, um, and, and valuing every part of our parish. The other thing I'm really proud of, and you all each played a part in this, it was grassroots. It wasn't a lot of um, you know politicians endorsing me. I had very few. One is in this room, Constable Alan Leone. Thank you so much for being uh, on Team Jen from day one. 
Uh, but again, it was about people and not, um, not you know, other politicos or um, behind the scenes shenanigans. And we ran a clean campaign. We ran a positive campaign. Um, for that, I'm very proud. And the part that each of you played in this campaign, I'm very proud of how you all handled this um, and just that you kept the things that are important at heart. So I am excited to get to work. We have a council meeting coming up Wednesday, so it is right back to work for Jefferson Parish. Um, but I'm looking forward to not just serving my district in the future, but of course, every part of this tremendous parish. We have made great strides and we will continue to do that. So for each of you out there um, watching, thank you for your support and I look forward to serving you. Thank you. All right, that is Jennifer Van Franken, one of the winners in the Jefferson Parish Council races that have been hotly contested over the last few weeks and months. And so uh, she is one of the winners tonight. And we want to talk a little bit more about the other uh, parish council races as well. Of course, Byron Lee, Derek Shepard, that's another big race that's happening tonight. Byron Lee has won. Uh, Clancy? There's only one precinct out, and Byron Lee is up by uh, about 500 votes. So with only one precinct out, there's no way that Shepard can overcome that. So Byron Lee is the winner. Uh, it's going to be roughly 52, 48, with only one precinct. Now that's not going to change. So All right, Clancy calling check it. Check mark by Byron Lee. <laughs> okay, very Clancy. hotly contested race. Very nasty. Uh, probably the nastiest council race, even more than I'm going to say nasty in terms of just intense back and forth. Yes. You know, going at each other. Uh, the Even more than race. Scott Walker, Dominic Impostato. Even more than Impostato Walker. Yeah, it was a closer a race, too. It's a closer yeah. race, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And it got personal. It yeah. did. It, it really got personal. personal. We, uh, talking about the family members, the attitudes, perceptions, behavior. I mean, it almost resembled a reality show in terms mm -hmm. of how contentious it got. You said, it, will the voters like one of them on the back end of this? Do you think Byron Lee is going to have uh, some ground to, to make up? Well, it's a new day. so. The winner should not be a sore winner. It should reach out and start building uh, collaboration with other members of the community that they did not receive support from. Uh, 5248, not a landslide, but it's a win. Mm -hmm. That's well said. You know, people got to know how to be gracious winners. It's, yes. Everybody talks about somebody being a sore loser, but there are sore winners out there too. Yeah. And you, you don't want to be one of those. Uh, no. Yeah, and it's important. This is an important district for the black community, especially. So they, they really is. play an integral role on that council in representing, you know, that part of the parish. Now, so. I, think, I think we have now called, you're seeing, uh, we can see results. So Rita Bohannon has won in District 4 yes. of Jefferson Parish Council. We called that one earlier. Now, but I think we need to point out something in the big picture of Jefferson Parish politics. This is a, a major shift on two levels. On one level, the so-called political machine or just the establishment lost tonight. Mm -hmm. Everybody from the consultant to the, all the big organizations, law enforcement endorsed you know, candidates who, who, who lost, both Ricky Templet and Dominic Impostata. A lot of the, the political incumbents, and the, it, what they call it the machine of the establishment, it doesn't matter. Voters wanted independence in Jefferson Parish. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, the, the, the independent voices won. On another level, when you look at the traditional makeup of the parish council with two at-large seats, you always had one at-large member from the West Bank and one from the East Bank. Now, both of the at-large council members live on the East Bank, and the West Bank of Jefferson Parish politics is very conscious of being yes. sort of the redheaded stepchild, as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they comprise just under 40% of the parish electorate, but they're going to have only two out of seven seats on the council. And I think they're going to be very conscious of that. So it's going to be up to both of the at large members to pay close attention to the West Bank mm -hmm. so that West Bank citizens and voters and, and even politicians and, and, you know, the establishment doesn't feel left out. Yeah, the West Bank has a very robust political machine. Yes. And if this is, a statement that you were saying that it is tonight, then they do have some ground to make up there as well. All right, so we're going to take a quick break for a little bit and we'll have, of course, more campaign coverage for you when we come back.
WWL-TV. This is a Campaign 23 special. Welcome back, everyone, to our Campaign 2023 special election coverage. A lot at stake for the state of Louisiana tonight, both on the statewide level and, of course, locally with a number of hot button races out there. Our group of political analysts has been with us throughout the night. Dr. Silas Lee, Dr. Ron Fauche and Clancy Dubos, our Eyewitness News political analyst and Gambit and Times Picayune columnist. So thank you all for being with us as we continue our coverage. We are very closely keeping an eye on that governor's race tonight. Jeff Landry has a chance to take it all without going into a runoff. Let's take a look at the numbers again. Jeff Landry right there, 95 percent mm -hmm. of precincts reporting. He is ahead by 52 percent. As we mentioned earlier tonight, he needs 50 plus one in order to avoid a runoff. Analysts, what do you all think? Do you think he's going to pull this I'm out? Lo I'm looking at the precincts that are out mm -hmm. and it looks like most of them are heavily African-American precincts. And that's so big for Sean Wilson. That's good for Sean Wilson. It's not good for, for Landry because Wilson's been getting a little bit north of 70, maybe close to 80% of the black vote uh, that's out there, whether it's in Orleans Parish or somewhere else. And there are literally dozens of, of precincts out in Orleans. In East Baton Rouge, it looks like you've got about two dozen precincts, 20 to 24 precincts in Caddo. That depends. Those could be white or black precincts in Baton Rouge or Caddo, so we don't know. But it's certainly in Orleans, it's most likely one, black mm -hmm. precincts. One thing it looks like here, though, is the precincts that are out have a higher African American percentage than the precincts that are in. Hmm. But the precincts that are out overall are more white than black. Okay, so the number and of that. that, keep, that then Landry and, can, and that we'll, keeps Landry very, in the game. That keeps him in the game very much. Okay. The other thing I'm looking at in terms of the raw numbers is a 200,000 vote difference between Landry and Wilson. So even though there are a lot of precincts out that have heavy African-American um, registered voters, we have to see where this falls. Can closing that gap, that 200,000 vote difference. Another thing I, I mentioned at the beginning, we started to look at the trends. So at 33%, then 50, now mm -hmm. we're at 95%. And it's been hovering around 48 to 52% for Landry. Mm -hmm. And we've seen Sean Wilson bounce back up to 26%. Yeah, in, in other words, the latest number we're seeing, Landry has 52.0. But five minutes ago, he had 51.8. Okay. So he's actually, he actually bumped up slightly in the last few minutes. Do you think this is going to come down to the wire? Are we going to be waiting? We always wait on the Orleans precincts. We always wait on the Orleans precincts. And it depends on how many there are. But we do have the Orleans early vote already in. All of that is in. That, and what and does that tell us? Well, first of all, it, it tells us that they've gotten their game together better than they used to because uh, used to be we didn't get the early vote in Orleans until the very end. Now we got it earlier in the evening as we do other parishes and that's an improvement. So the only uh, vote that's out from Orleans is election day vote and it's not all of it, it's part of it. And it depends on whether it's Lakeview or the Ninth Ward or Algiers. Typically oh, it's East. East New Orleans and Algiers, most of it, not all of it, but most of it comes from East New Orleans and Algiers mm -hmm. at the end of the evening. Don't they have to bring them physically over it, to the- It's kind of like that. To the it's, East it's, Bank? They, they wait till they get the, the, the slots in, you know, the machine pieces that, that contain the data. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when they want to make sure they can double check it before they load it up. They don't want to just go with the initial, you know, phoned in results, if that's what it is, but they want to make sure they have the, everything they need to, to verify it on the day of and then they, they, they load it in and then it gets looked at and audited later on the, in terms of the whole parish. But they, but they physically want, they bring it. They be very careful about it. Yeah, they physically bring it over yes. to, the, to Tulane and Broad and yes. upload it there. So yes. that's right. a, one of the one, reasons it takes so one, long. Right. One thing fascinating is in, in the poll we did for WWL and other media outlets across the state, mm -hmm. which I believe we took that about seven weeks ago now, mm -hmm. um, the, what, what I call the single digit candidates, which was uh, Wagusback, Schroeder, Hewitt, and Lundy, they were getting a total of 15% mm -hmm. together combined. And, and they expected to, and I think most people expected their vote to, to, to grow significantly. And at this point, 
combined, they're getting about 18%. So they, they hardly moved at all hmm. in, in the seven most critical weeks of the election. Why do you think that is? Well, I think it, it, it you know, first of all, most voters didn't know these candidates at all at the beginning of the campaign. And, and even, you know, seven um, weeks before the election, most mm -hmm. voters still didn't know who they were. Mm -hmm. and, and as they voted today, probably most voters didn't know who they were. Yeah. And, uh, and I just think it became uh, sort of a Landry versus the field kind of a race. and. Uh, uh, and he became the Republican candidate, he had the Republican endorsement, he had Donald Trump's endorsement. And we can't forget Donald Trump got 58% of the vote in the last presidential race. It was interesting hearing Steve Scalise talk about Donald Trump tonight and the fact that Donald Trump's endorsement of his opponent, opponent for the speaker race, he <laughs> feels, actually pushed some votes into his category and in, in his right. favor. So that was interesting to hear that about the power of Donald Trump. So um, it, it has been a factor in Louisiana and especially with Jeff Landry and how close that they have been and how close his policies have tied it, to the president. Is, Dr. It, Lee, you want to add something? You know, you asked about why the candidates didn't grow. The single digit candidates, they had a heavy presence in terms of media buy during the news cycle. Mm -hmm. We have a very fragmented news environment right now. Not everyone sees and observes the news at the same time. Mm -hmm. So they can get it from social media, they can go on the websites. Therefore, the news cycle ad buys probably didn't have as much impact as they thought, but they had a heavy presence. And it goes back to retail politics. Mm -hmm. You have to be seen in the community. It's something that takes time and resources. So there's several other elements involved, uh, not voter interest too, but Landry had the advantage of name recognition, yes, organization much. already out there. He already had a lot of momentum behind him. He was able to bring in big name Donald Trump for fundraisers. So that, that helped him, whereas the other candidates, they had to struggle to get attention. Yeah, and there were deals going on before the other candidates even got out of the gate to get Jeff Landry that endorsement from the Republican Party, if you guys right. remember. I mean, he was out before anybody else was. He had already secured that in this race, and so it makes you wonder if that played a role as well. Yeah. Well, um, one other thing, too, is it looks to me like election day uh, turnout in the end, voter turnout, benefited Landry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one and, second, uh, Ron. Before sure. you finish that thought, uh, Wagesback is speaking, so let's take a listen to what he has to say. Of course, one of the main Republican candidates here. Louisiana was, had so much infinite potential, and it just needed the right people to unlock that potential. And I think many of the people who are going to help do that are in this room tonight. So I want to thank you all for being with us on this show. We, we worked our tails off <laughs> the last seven months, and I would do it again in a heartbeat because it was the thrill of a lifetime. It was unbelievable to feel the heart and the presence of the people of Louisiana, and I was just truly un, you know, blown away by, by the entire thing. But at the end of the day, I want to tell you, election nights are about math, and <laughs> math tells us two things tonight. One, we're not going to make it to the runoff, but that's okay. And the second thing I think it tells us is that our next governor is going to be Jeff Landry. And I want you to listen to me here. When I started this campaign, I asked you to believe in Louisiana. I asked you to believe in me. I asked you to believe in a better day coming tomorrow. And that needs to happen in Louisiana. So we all owe it to our state and we owe it to our next governor. And we owe it to the grandkids and the, and the kids that come after us to do whatever we can to make this a state that's right for all of us. And so I hope you join me in doing that in the days to come because the movement and the energy that I felt on this campaign, let me tell you something, it was real. It was real. People are ready to roll up their sleeves and get to work solving the issues of the state. People are ready to make this state more affordable again and a better place for our, for our kids to grow old here again. It's going to take all of us, and we all have to be there, not just for our next governor, but for the next legislators that are coming in to do a lot of hard, heavy lifting. So I'm going to be there, and I'm asking you to be there with me. And in the days and weeks to come, you can expect a phone call and a text and maybe a letter or two from me. 
I'm going to try to put in words how thankful I am. I won't be able to do it because you've meant more to me than you'll ever realize. To my wife, Colleen, to my mom, Judy, to my sons. We are all Team Louisiana, so in the words I always like to end every meeting with, go fight win. Thank you all very much. Gubernatorial candidate Stephen Wagesback conceding tonight. He got less than 6% of the vote. Acknowledged that he feels like Jeff Landry is poised to become the state's next governor, whether he does that tonight or in a runoff, uh, through his support behind Landry, a man that he has been battling since he joined this campaign. Um, you know, we're taking a look at the numbers right now. 96% of the precincts reporting. Jeff Landry still holds 52%. Our analysts, what do you think about that? I mean, we're just kind of watching precinct by precinct come in. You've all said that Orleans Parish is going to play a key role here. It is, but I'm just wondering if there's enough African-American vote still out there to deprive Landry of an election night, primary night mm -hmm. win. Uh, as, as we get closer and closer, it looks more and more like he's going to win it all tonight. Um, we're not quite ready to say yes definitively, but it's looking really good for Jeff Landry right now. It looks like the, the percentage has stabilized now. Uh, uh, as we just said a, a moment ago, he was at 51.8. So he had, had moved down a, a few tenths of a point. Mm -hmm. And if that had continued going, you could say, well, maybe this wouldn't happen. But uh, as it stands now, you know, he went back to 52 and it's been holding. You've got 96% of the precincts in, and I would say the odds favor that he wins everything to Doug. Silas, do you have anything Since else? we've been talking, the percentage of uh, precincts coming in went up 1%, right. and a different and differential the yeah. in right. the vote, still at 200,000. Yeah. So no matter what comes in, we are at 3,700 uh, out of 3,900, 200 more precincts coming in. That's a significant gap to try to close, mm -hmm. so we still have to see. But it stabilized, like Ron said, in that 50% range. Mm -hmm. one, one thing I would also point out is right now we have 1,032,000 votes in. Uh, four years ago in the primary, 1,380,000 people voted. So it looks, pr you know, pretty certain that the, the turnout will be less than it was four years ago, and it will probably be closer than it to it was eight years ago when John Bell Edwards and David Vitter were running. Mm -hmm. That year it was 39% and it was 1,170,000 and like a cigarette, 1,032,000. Hmm. So the turnout may be you know, another, close another to about 40%. So, yeah, 90, yeah. 90 to 100,000 Yeah, 39, votes. 40%, yeah. Which, is, which, is a rel which is a low turnout. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. obviously plays a role when we're talking about uh, you know, the, the different areas of the state that he needed to, sure. to capture in order to, well, <laughs> that Sean Wilson needed to capture right. in order to force a runoff with Jeff right. Landry. But, uh, but and other really candidates think, as well. You're right. Well, Jeff Landry's vote was the most motivated vote out there. That showed up in the early votes, mm -hmm. the early voting results, and it's showing up today in, you know, the election night results, election day results. When I mean, you put them all together, Landry not only had the most effective campaign, the most consistent message, the most money, the most resources, the most name recognition, but he had the most fired up voters. And that matters more than anything at some point, especially on, on election day. If your voters are more motivated mm -hmm. and it's a low turnout, if you've got enough of those motivated voters, yep. you're going to win. And Landry's on the cusp of doing that. All right, Dr. Lee. I think a critical element we need to reinforce is the fact that Landry had a base to run from. Wilson, not an elected official, no base, no organizational infrastructure or uh, institutions to support him. Uh, he had to build a coalition. So all of that plays a factor into runoff, um, getting into the runoff and making a very competitive showing. Now, if, we, if Jeff Landry does manage to pull this off tonight, mm -hmm. what does that say about his mandate or lack thereof? Uh -huh. Is there one, does it affect how he's able to jump out of the gate? Be careful. 
Yeah. Don't overreach. Yeah. At the, uh, because it's with 52%, that also means you have 48% voting for someone else. But this is a very fragile social and political environment. Mm -hmm. And if you try to overreach and implement some programs or policies or agenda too fast, there's still time to heal. He's going to have a honeymoon period. Mm -hmm. So now is the time to try to convince those supporters who were not supporting you to come over and give you a chance. There was a definite uh, feeling, I think, among a lot of Republicans mm -hmm. that they did not want Jeff Landry in this yes. position. And that's why we saw, you know, Wagesback enter the race late, I feel like, mm -hmm. when he did. Can we talk about that a little bit? What about that anybody but Landry vote here? Well, well, there just wasn't a lot of it. I mean, first of all, it was only among Republicans mm -hmm. uh, because you had a significant number of Democrats who weren't going to vote for Landry no matter what. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, you know, the fact that Wagesback, Schroeder, Lundy, and Hewitt you know, together only got, you know, a percentage of the vote that each one of them thought they had a shot at getting, mm -hmm. shows that, that it, it collapsed at the end. Yeah, yeah it, I think that's what happened. There was a significant anybody but Landry sentiment out there, but as time wore on, by the time we got to qualifying and then Labor Day, mm -hmm. the anybody but Landry sentiment gave way to an inevitability of Landry. And speaking of Landry, Landry he is taking the podium is right tonight, there. a man who is poised to possibly win the governor's race outright. So let's listen to what he has to say. <laughs> All right. So, so I have one question. Do you love Louisiana? Because I love Louisiana. You know, I want to tell you, I want to bring you back just a little bit. I want, I want to let you know, you know, um, when I was young, and I, I know my father's here, and he, he probably won't remember this, but he gave me a book when I was a young teenager, and it was kind of odd because most of the books that were shoved to me came from my mom. But he gave me a book about the Acadians. He gave me a book about the Cajuns, and when you open the preference of that book and explain the 300 years that the Acadians were here in Louisiana. It said that there were three tenants, three tenants that the Cajun people live by. And it was God, and it was family, and it was country. But I don't believe that those tenants just belong to the Cajuns, they belong to everyone in Louisiana. Because, the Louis, because Louisiana people are people of deep faith. In fact, we've got over 7,000 houses of worship in a state of only four and a half million people. Because we know that all things are possible through God. And tonight is one of them. And God has blessed this state and God has blessed our people. And then it's about family. You know, tonight, I want to thank my family, my wife and my son. They have endured unbelievably grueling schedules and an environment in politics that has reached from the national stage to the state level. And Sharon has stood as a rock. She has been our compass. And she has been our rudder in sometimes a chaotic sea. And JT, he has spent his entire childhood, his entire childhood with us serving the people of this state. And he has done that in the shadow of politics and he's been amazing. He has shouldered it well to my father, my siblings, my uncles, my aunts, my cousins, all of you who have been friends, many of you who have raised me since, well, we won't talk about how small. <laughs> but you know, you have challenged me, you have picked me up, you have counseled me, you have raised me, all of y'all. As I look across this crowd and I see those faces and I think from childhood all the way through, y'all are a part of me. And you know what? <clears throat> this state is my family. And we are going to work to fix this state. Because you know why? 
Because that's what families do. You see, families are committed to each other. And I want to share with you how special, how committed, if you do not think the people of this state are committed, I want to share with you a story from today. Today, a childhood friend of mine, a man who is like a brother, who has been a paraplegic for over 30 something years, who has been bedridden for months, called his mom and he said, you get me out of that bed. You get me in my chair because I'm going to vote. I'm, he could have voted by mail. He could have done that. But he got in a chair and he went down to that polling place and he said, I want to vote because I want to vote for my state because I love my state. And that's the commitment. And let me tell you something. That is the commitment we have to you. Because we hold our families and our friends close. And then finally, it's country. You know, it's, when you think about a country, our country is our state, our state is our community. And you know, I have traveled, we have traveled all around this state. Big cities, small towns, and we have absolutely seen the greatness of the people of this state. And tonight's, ele tonight's election, make no mistake about it, it was historic. It was a clear signal. Tonight's election says that our state is united and it's a wake up call. It's a message that everyone should hear loud and clear that we, the people of this state, are going to expect more out of our government from here on out. And you know, I'm not joking when I say we. I mean, there are so many people out there, so many of you who are all a part of this. I can't name you all, but you know who you are. I want to recognize our staff, unbelievable. Our volunteers were just amazing. The activists, everyone who worked extra hard. Those who invested both treasure and sweat in this election. I want you to know that those people gave the people of this state an election that was about you. This election was always about the people of this state. And to me, that is the most important accomplishment of tonight, that we were able to focus on you because that's what we're going to continue to focus on. Because when we focus on you, that's how we create success. And I believe that Louisiana is ready to become one team that rejects the past and embraces the future. I'm going to close with this. I have said, I have said from the beginning that our state is blessed with the most hardworking, courageous, fun-loving, wonderful people in the world. We care about our values. We're strong in faith. We care about our friends, our family, and our community. And now it's time. Because listen, the journey's not over. Y'all don't get, y'all get party tonight. <laughs> but we got a lot to do, okay? So have fun. Because now, we're going to start putting smiles on the people of this state. Where we're going to stay living in Louisiana is easy and bringing people here is more. God bless you. Let's have a great time. This is your victory. Thank you so very much. I love you. We love you all. Thank you so very much. As Jeff Landry was speaking and making his acceptance speech, we have declared that we are calling this race for Jeff Landry. 99% of the precincts reporting. We have enough in that our political analysts say Jeff Landry will take the governor's office tonight uh, outright without a runoff. And so this is um, surprising to some, maybe not surprising to others. What made you all decide that we were confident in calling this? <laughs> well, look at the numbers, the 200,000 yeah. vote difference for one, mm -hmm. the fact that Landry put his foot on the pedal from the very beginning, never took it off. Uh, Sean Wilson was able to build support, but it was hard to build in terms of Jeff Landry's huge uh, watch us, mm -hmm. resources, name recognition, 
and motivated voters. Yeah, apparently Sean Wilson is now calling Jeff Landry right now and he's expected to come down and speak in just a little mm -hmm. while. But, mm -hmm. you know, this is something that we've been watching closely as Orleans Parish, of course, uh, has been some of the latest, uh, have have had some of the late, latest results coming in, which is something that we see right. regularly on election right. night. Well, well, the, you know, the big thing that convinced me was uh, as these final precincts were coming in, mm -hmm. his numbers were not going down. Mm -hmm. Now they did slip 0.4 at, at the very end, which probably meant there was a slug of Orleans precincts in. Right. But in. even if they still drift down a little bit, he's probably got at least his 50, 50 51%. Yeah. yeah, the raw numbers. The raw numbers are in. Clancy Dubose is standing by. Uh, with a look at just giving us some historical perspective on this uh, and breaking down the numbers a little bit for us. Yeah, as we look at this, the numbers you're seeing, 51.6 for Jeff Landry wow. statewide. But look at the colors on this map. All the red is Jeff Landry, where he runs first. He doesn't necessarily have a majority, but when you add up all the votes, he has a slight majority, just over 51%, which is probably going to hold even after the Orleans precincts come in. It may go down to 51 50.9, or it may even stay at 51.6, but it's going to be somewhere around there. It's going to be within a half a percent of where it is right now. But look at the where the green is here. These four parishes where Sean Wilson ran first. Now, let's go back four years and look at the race between John Bell Edwards, who was then the incumbent governor, and Eddie Rispone. This is the runoff numbers. Again, the red was for Rispone, but look at all the blue that John Bell Edwards carried, where the Democrat carried the election, and Edwards got 51.3. Now, it's a reverse in terms of who got, wh where they got their votes, but the numbers were just over 51% for Edwards, a Democrat, four years ago, but this year, it's just over 51% because Caddo wasn't blue, all of the river parishes, the Delta parishes were not blue, and uh, some of the river parishes down here were not, are not blue tonight. And that's the difference. Jeff Landry really took on the aura of inevitability by the time we got to late August, early September. And that's when the other candidates finally started attacking him, and the attacks just didn't stick. Plus, Landry had enough resources to answer those attacks, and he answered them very effectively. And he held on to his vote. He stayed on his message. He focused on crime. He was the only candidate who focused almost exclusively on crime, and crime has been the number one issue on everybody's mind, and that was a good issue for somebody who is an attorney general to hit on in a governor's race. So we're seeing this map. It's not only solidly red for Jeff Landry, but the actual numbers on, and then again, this is a field of 16 candidates. That's a phenomenal performance by any candidate, and you gotta give Jeff Landry credit. We have the, the check mark next to his name. He is now governor-elect Jeff Landry. When the final results from Orleans Parish, let's look at Orleans very quickly, 68,000 votes. We may have another 20,000 votes out there, but that's not gonna change the difference here. It's gonna stay, Jeff Landry, going back to the totals, he's gonna stay, you know, somewhere at uh, 51% or a little higher when it's all said and done. And uh, Dr. Lee, what do you all take away from this tonight and the way that he was able to uh, position himself to be able to take this in, you know, the primary without having a runoff? What's our takeaway? Well, I think the takeaway is that Louisiana is a conservative state. Uh, it, it's a leaning Republican state. And I think what happened effectively is the Democrats, both voters and leaders in the state, basically kind of threw up their hands and say, well, we're, you know, we're probably not going to win this, so we'll do what we can, but, but we're not going to, you know, kill ourselves over this. And, and, it, and, it's, and, and, and Landry became the conservative candidate, the Republican candidate, the Trump endorsement, the party endorsement, all those things help, and he was, and he also picked up some Democrats. A lot of Democrats who wanted to bet on a winner went with him. Do we think that there's been a lack of leadership in the Democratic Party in Louisiana? Have we seen changes? You know, Karen Carter Peterson over the last few years, she was very strong. It's in the stage of rebuilding. I would say they need to build a bench. They need to. Um, become more aggressive and visible on the issues. Naturally, they need to cultivate a new field of candidates in terms of expanding support 
in the party and in the state. So it's a challenge for the uh, party, given the fact that we're in a very red state right now, mm -hmm. but there are opportunities for the Democrats. What do we also know about Jeff Landry and the national Republican trends that we're seeing? Um, is this following in line with what we're seeing nationally with Donald Trump still being a major player in the presidential race? Well, red states vote red. Yeah. And it's a red state, you know, and, and not just Donald Trump, but Mitt Romney, John McCain, mm -hmm. all the Republican candidates in recent years have been carrying Louisiana by big, big margins. Mm -hmm. And uh, and now we have a, a governor, the, the John Bell Edwards, you know, moderate Democrat uh, two elections, they were really kind of an exception to the rule here, I think. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing we just need to remember, it's a very close race between a number of Republican uh, Southern governors and um, Democrats governors, 26-24 mm -hmm. uh, nationwide, mm -hmm. slight edge to the Democrats. Hmm. Okay, well interesting stuff. Clancy is standing by talking about the Secretary of State's race, which has been interesting. We have seen some, some different trends in that race. Yes, what hmm. we have here is a, a traditional Democrat-Republican runoff. Nancy Landry and Gwen Collins green up both at 19% right. with, 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 with almost 99% reporting they're in the runoff. Clancy, I'm going to jump in for and a quick we're second. Back we have, to now. Yeah, we have Mike Cooper that is coming to the podium right now. We're looking at the campaign results for St. Tammany Parish President uh, Cooper with 51 percent. I'm told that he is approaching the podium. Our Lily Cummings is there. Uh, let's toss it on over to there. Every race is close, but we got to this point for so many reasons. The number one reason is standing right next to me. <laughs> My wife, Catherine, my beautiful wife, Catherine, and family, all of my family. We have an extended family here this evening. Cousins, brothers, sisters, aunts and uncles, in-laws, and outlaws. Children. Children, grandchildren. No good. And so many people, so many supporters. So many supporters here. We've got Team Cooper, who I was just talking about. Our team, Team Cooper, the Cooper family, the extended Cooper family. And Team Tammany. Team Tammany. Team Tammany. Team Tammany is is our workforce at St. Tammany Parish Government for the past four years who have taken us to this level where we're addressing the needs of our citizens. We're addressing infrastructure, roads, bridges, drainage, water and sewage utilities, coastal restoration, flood protection, and so much more here in our parish. And we've got so much more to go. And that's what I'm here to do for the next four years, to continue serving you and to address smart growth, sustainable growth for our parish to maintain the quality of life that we all deserve. That is St. Tammany Parish President-elect Mike Cooper getting a second term in office. Uh, hearing from him tonight as he defeats Greg Cromer, who is the Slidell mayor for the job. Uh, of course, we're following that gubernatorial race. Jeff Landry winning it tonight outright without a runoff. But there are also some very other some other very important statewide races that are up for grabs tonight. We wanted to talk about those a little bit, break those down. Attorney General, Secretary of State, State Treasurer, all of those major posts are up for grabs tonight as well. So let's go over to Clancy, who can break it down for us a little bit more. Okay, we're looking now at a map that shows the Secretary of State results. And in contrast to the governor's race, where it's just red or green, 
Jeff Landry or Sean Wilson, for Secretary of State, it's multicolored because it was a tighter race among the top five candidates, especially among the top three or four. Nancy Landry and Gwen Collins Green up with 99% reporting, they are in the runoff. Lancy's, uh, Landry is a Republican, Gwen Collins Greenup is a Democrat. Uh, Landry is kind of, she's no relation to Jeff Landry, first of all. She's a former state representative from the uh, Lafayette area, and she, for the past four years or more, has been the first assistant secretary of state. So she has kind of sort of run as an incumbent, and you can see where she has run strong. And even though Mike Francis carried all of this area, Mike Francis and Nancy Landry are both from the Lafayette area. They're both Republicans. Gwen Collins Greenup is a Democrat. It, go quickly back to the governor's race. This is what it looks like when it's a Democrat versus a Republican. And the, it's more likely to be something more like 54 to 55%. And I'm not calling it, but that's generally the trend when you, in a statewide race, when you have a Republican and a Democrat, the Republican gets between 55 and 57 percent of the vote, and we'll see how that plays out. But that's the way it starts out in the race for Secretary of State in the runoff between Nancy Landry, who is uh, the first assistant Secretary of State, a Republican, and Gwen Collins Greenup, uh, the Democrat, who has run for this office before, made the runoff before, and lost. Now, in the race for Attorney General, that was more of a two-person race. Liz Murrell, who was the top assistant to Jeff Landry, is supported by Landry, and I'm told supported by Trump as well, the leading Republican in the race, is now in a runoff with Lindsey Cheek, a Democrat, who really didn't mount a, a very expansive or expensive campaign, but because she had that D behind her name, she got 23% and edged out John Stefanski, a Republican from the Lafayette area. He, you can see the one green parish, Lafayette, that's where Stefanski is from. Uh, is actually from Crowley, but he, you know, it's right next door to Lafayette, so that was his base. And so Morrill, tracking Landry's vote, got 45.3%, just 6% less than her boss, Jeff Landry, got in the, in the governor's race. But look at, look at her map, where she's strong, and then look at the governor's race. You can see there's a lot of overlay there. So when, when the final results come back in in the runoff, Lafayette is certainly going to go strong for uh, Morrill. It's, a, it's, a, it's always been a Republican, or for generations, it's been a Republican stronghold, as has Baton Rouge and, and all these Florida parishes. So Morrill goes into the runoff a very strong favorite, but the race has yet to be run. And again, going back to the governor's race, you can see not a lot of difference between this race and this one. So looking really good for Liz Morrill going into the runoff. All right, that is some interesting insight. Thank you, Clancy, for that. Uh, you know, these statewide races um, are going to be interesting in the runoff. Um, obviously, we don't have a governor leading the way. Is that going to have an impact, do you think? Probably lower turnout. Yeah. Uh, we were one month away, right before going into, into the holidays. Mm -hmm. Voters, if they didn't pay attention to the governor's race, they will probably pay less attention to these. But it will be incumbent upon the candidates running to motivate and form and build this coalition to make sure that they get their supporters to the poll and early vote. But yeah. that, but it, it looks like the Republicans are well on their way to a complete sweep. To a sweep. Yeah. Uh, these low turnout elections, particularly in the runoff, are going to benefit Republicans. And uh, so they're, they're in the process of sweeping your party. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we also had the state treasurer's race, which another statewide race. Uh, of course, we had um, John Schroeder, who was running for governor. He's the former treasurer. He would have mm -hmm. been, been the incumbent in this race, but he decided to run for governor, obviously unsuccessfully tonight. But let's head over to Clancy again, who can break down that race for us. Clancy? Again, you're looking at now the color codes. John Fleming and Dustin Granger in a runoff. Just like the other races we call, John Fleming, the leading candidate, a Republican, he, like Landry, was the official nominee or the pretty much the official nominee of the Republican Party. Granger, the only Democrat in the race. Scott McKnight, a well-respected state representative from Baton Rouge, a Republican also, but couldn't cut into Fleming's vote enough. So you're going to see John Fleming and Dustin Granger in a runoff for uh, state treasurer. Looking at this map again, the yellow or mustard color is the Republican vote for Fleming, and the orange vote, pink-orange vote, is 
the Democrat vote for Granger, compare that to the governor's race, you don't see a lot of difference going back and forth. And so it looks very good for John Fleming, a former congressman, I'm gonna go back to treasurer, Fleming, a former congressman from the northeast part of the state, uh, lost a race for uh, U.S. Senate, retired, he's, a, he's a, a physician, a businessman, very successful and a very active member of the Republican Party in North Louisiana, and he probably will emerge as a prohibitive favorite in the runoff, uh, as most Republicans are when it's a Republican-Democrat race in Louisiana. As Dr. Fauché said, this is a red state, the red states vote Republican. Um, we also had some uh, state legislative races, some of them that are also interesting, as we mentioned, Cameron Henry, um, you know, from Metairie, poised to become the next Senate president, at least that's what he's been jockeying for and pushing for, um, uh, you know, behind the scenes as he, you know, faced re-election tonight. Uh, we had the Mandy Landry race. Uh, have we looked at that race yet and, and taken a look to see, um, she had a significant lead earlier in the night. Right, she has 65% of the vote at this point. That's uh, 43 out of 47 precincts. So it looks like that Mandy Landry, again, who is not related to, to uh, Jeff Landry. the incumbent. That's three Landrys that are not related, right, running for different the offices. Of Jeff right. Yes, but, yeah. um, she is. But it looks like that she has a significant lead for re-election. And what about Pat Connick? Pat Connick has won that race. Uh, all 75 precincts are in. It actually is the vast majority of the precincts are in Jefferson Parish, but there are a few precincts um, in, uh, I think it is uh, Plaquemines Parish. Not many, but two or three precincts in Plaquemines Parish. But all of the precincts are in, and Connick has 52% of that vote. So he is re-elected. Uh, you know, there's some other important races that we should look at too, if you want to scroll through them. Yeah, let's go through uh, them. Let's, let's call up the legislative races if we can. Yeah, there's, you see the check mark there for Pat Connick. Mm -hmm. uh, this is State Rep District 23. This is a brand new district that was carved out in New Orleans because of changes in population. New Orleans actually gained a seat in the House of Representatives. Huh. And it's, it's got an odd number, 23, because there was a district in North Louisiana called District 23. It went away because population dropped significantly. Orleans gained a little bit, at least compared to others. And so New Orleans got a district. And you have, it's all Democrat. It's, um, I think it's majority African-American, but the two Democrats that are in the runoff are Tammy Savoie, who used to be in a neighboring district, District 94. Uh, she lost to Stephanie Hilferty uh, four years ago. Now she's in a runoff against Sean Mina, or Sean Mena, who is uh, African American Democrat. That's going to be a tight race. It's going to be hotly contested. I don't mean in an in ugly sense, but it's sure. going to be it's going to be a tough race for both of them. Um, I would say Mena might be a slight favorite, but it really depends on turnout. Sure. Mm. Really does. Which we've just established is probably going to be yes. low. Very yes. low. Very low, uh, especially since we have uh, elected apparently a governor tonight. So let's look at some other of the races out there. There were a lot of legislative races that we were voting on tonight. Peter Egan in State Rep District 74, Buffy Singletary in a runoff. What do we know about this race, Clancy? Uh, I believe it's, well, it's, not, it's not Orleans Parish, and I don't think it's Jefferson either. So I'm not sure. Uh, it might be a River Parish's uh, district. And uh, you, you see in there, it's at St. Tammany, I believe someone's telling me. So that's, uh, yeah, Peter Egan and Buffy Singletary. Uh, that might be uh, Nelson's district yes, uh, that, uh, I in think the Mandeville Covington yes. area. So you can see there, all, it's solid Republican. Mm -hmm. So that gives you a hint that it's St. Tammany. And again, Peter Egan with 47% came very close, but all 30 precincts reporting, he and Buffy Singletary headed for a runoff. Okay, let's go to the next one. State Representative District 76, Stephanie hunter Baralt, 79% reporting. I mean 79% of the vote. 79% of the vote with all precincts in, again, an all Republican head-to-head -head race. Mm -hmm. This is what you're gonna see in a lot of places across Louisiana. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you saw that map where Jeff Landry, everything was red. Uh, the legislature is going to be overwhelmingly red, probably a super majority for the Republicans. And now we have a Repu Republican governor the at the helm as well. Senate, right. So yes. it's gonna be a... And it also looks like 
a lot of these uh, legislative incumbents won. Yes. Yes. Uh, this is, right. Now this yeah. is a Jefferson Parish West Bank uh, race. Kyle Green Jr., the incumbent, uh, having served one term, overwhelmingly beats his Republican opponent, Reginald Jasmine, 71 percent to 29 percent. No big surprise there. Kyle Green's done a very good job as a state rep, uh, very well represented his district in the West Bank. Uh, state Rep District 85. Mm -hmm. uh, this, I believe, is also, uh, it's, it's in the Metro New Orleans area. I think part of it is Jefferson Parish. Vincent Cox and uh, has won outright with 62% of the vote, 23 of 23 precincts reporting over Democrat Andrea Manuel and Andrew Bennett, a no-party independent. All right, Rodney Lyons, mm -hmm. an incumbent, uh, I think he's into his third term now, beginning his third term. Uh, Again, this is a West Bank, African-American district. Uh, Representative Lyons uh, you know, did a very good tonight. job his first two terms, and I'm not surprised that he's back in with 70% of the vote. Okay, next. This is the district right next to Kyle Green's district on the West Bank okay. of Jefferson Parish. Okay, next. State Senate District 1, Bob Owen, Robert Owen, 61% to 39. Yeah, this is uh, two incumbent state reps running mm -hmm. for an open seat. I believe this was Sharon Hewitt's district. Mm -hmm. This is in Slidell. And, and Slidell and St. Bernard. Mm -hmm. uh, Gara Fallow is a state rep from the Chalmette, St. Bernard area. Owen, a North Shore state rep. North Shore High School graduate. My fellow North Shore High School graduate. Well, you got to get that in there. <laughs> yeah. and, and, uh, Owen overwhelmingly defeating Gara Fallow, an all-Republican race head-to-head, -head, but it was not close. Yeah, Bob Owen going to the state Senate. Next one, State Senate District 2, Edward Price, the incumbent, incumbent there. Yes, this is, a, a, I believe it's a River Parishes type uh, district, and he's the incumbent, defeats a, a African-American challenger, Democrat, Republican, mm -hmm. but it's very overwhelmingly a Democrat district, so it's no surprise there okay. that the incumbent wins again. Let's go to the next one. District 8. This is Pat Connick's race. Almost all West Bank of uh, Jefferson Parish. Uh, Pat Connick was my classmate at Loyola Law School. There you so go. Called him my classmates. It was actually my study partner as well. Huh? Uh, so we carried each other through law school. <laughs> so he yes, was, but he, he, but he you didn't close. have a governor like I had. You, well, but I'm not 130 a years old. Yeah, well, <laughs> but, but I want to take what I can. You know. <laughs> uh, Cameron Henry uh, winning overwhelmingly over his Democrat opponent. This is a, a, a district like Connick's. It's, it's more than one parish. Mm -hmm. Connick has a few precincts and Plaquemines. Cameron Henry has a few uptown New Orleans precincts. Mm -hmm. Big win for him, but the even bigger win with this grant, with this huge victory of his, he also looks well poised to become the next president of the Louisiana Senate. So that's, a leadership position important. at stake. Next one, Beth, Beth Mizell, a North Shore uh, incumbent running mm -hmm. for re-election uh, from Bogalusa. She handily defeats two Democratic opponents. This is a very Republican district. Mm -hmm. And 78% of the vote, not close at all. Okay, next one. State Senate District 19. This is a, a district that uh, the, uh, Greg Miller was, uh, it is a, an incumbent state rep from the River Parishes in the uh, area just, just up river from uh, the, the Spillway, that area, St. Yes. Charles Parish. Uh, solid conservative, very well liked by his colleagues, easily wins uh, that district. He's a Republican, and uh, so you can see that. Well, people with well-known names, a Republican beating a Democrat, All right. no surprise there. Of course, the and big race Sean tonight, <laughs> the governor's race, there's Sean Wilson, the Democrat, March making his speech six. tonight, his concession speech. What's his name? And there are no regrets in the Wilson household. No. Because we made a difference in the state of Louisiana. Yes, we did. The difference one makes is not always the outcome that one would have, but we made a difference in this race. And I reflect on the fact that I called Jeff Landry and congratulated him on the victory tonight because the citizens of Louisiana spoke or didn't speak and made a decision. That's right. And every good American, every good Louisianian accepts those consequences. Yes. And I stand before you here tonight with my family and friends and loved ones and people all across the state of Louisiana that understands those consequences and we accept that and say job well done yeah. for Team yeah. Wilson. Yeah. When I made the decision, after much prayer with my wife and my family and people who I counsel with on a regular basis, I said, what if I ran? 
And I thought about where I would be as an old man and would hate to say, what if I had run and didn't run? That's right. Because I love this state and this state has loved me back. And I also thought, what if I said, oh, well, I ran. And we made one hell of a difference, and I think we did. Yes. Because when I think about the debates in this race, and I had this conversation with Jeff tonight, it is important that the 500,000 people, half a million people keep the Medicaid expansion that they've got. I firmly believe that. And I trust that I will hold him accountable to do exactly what he said he's going to do, which was make sure that those half a million people have the benefits that they have. That's right. I also said to him that it's important to pay our teachers what they need to be paid and educate our children the way they need to be educated. There are many issues that we dealt with in this race, from insurance to infrastructure, from minimum wage to making sure that we had the resources to help those who are less fortunate, those who might not have a white collar, those who might not have a blue collar, might not have a shirt. It's important for the state of Louisiana to show up for those people each and every day. And so as I stand here today, very proud of the race that we've won, very thankful yes. for the thousands of people that gave to this campaign that saw opportunity, that saw potential in what we could be. I use this as a rallying call to say, let's hold our government accountable to do just that. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure that our governors, our legislators, our senators show up to do what we expect them to do. That is what Louisiana is built on. We are a resilient people, and you have to show up every day. And while we might not understand everything that Jeff Landry wants to do as governor, I believe he wants to try to do the right thing, and it's our job as Louisianians to make that happen. And when it's not happening, it's our jobs to call it out. It's our jobs to hold him accountable. It's our jobs to stand up for the people of this great state. And so you all have blessed me and my staff and my family and my friends who have traveled 50,000 miles since March 10th. And we did it for this little guy and this little girl right here because we want them to stay here in Louisiana. So when they go to medical school, we want them to work on Louisiana patients. When we go to education, we want them to teach Louisiana students. And when they go into engineering, we want them to build infrastructure in the state of Louisiana. We are going to build an economy like you've never seen one day. And I just hope and pray that it's sooner rather than later, because we all have a stake in this. This is our state. This is our state. And it's time that we entrust all of those who are residents here and love on them and trust them to make the decisions to protect themselves. Right. It's time for us to stipe the division. Yeah. It's time for us to let people make the decisions they need to make for their own lives. It's time for us to rise to a new level and be the Louisiana that God created us to be. And so I thank you for all of your support. I thank you for the time. We are going to celebrate the success of what we've done tonight because it's not over. When I said my ministry was public service for 25 years, I meant that. And my ministry doesn't stop when I retired from the state of Louisiana. I said this on the campaign trail. When people show you who they are, believe them. And I've shown you who I am. When they tell you who they are, take them at their word. And I've told you exactly what that was. And so I want you to do the same thing for me. Don't give up on Louisiana. Don't give up on this great state because we've got a lot more ahead of us and it's up to each and every one of us to show up and vote and make a difference when that time comes. So God bless you. Thank you all for what you've done. Yeah. We're gonna celebrate. We're gonna mingle. We're gonna visit. We've got a bunch of folks here tonight that I absolutely have to acknowledge. Where's Congressman Carter? He's here. He's back here. We've got several councilmen. I've got several senators and representatives. Royce DePlessis is there. We got a whole bunch of other folks. But I would be remiss if I didn't thank the lady who is the rock for my family. She is my girlfriend, my best friend. She's my everything. Rocky, my first lady, whatever happens in the elections. I would be remiss if the lady who loved me first didn't say Sean has been a winner all of his life. All of his, all of his life. 
My mom's here. Yeah. I've got my daughter, my son, my son-in-law, and my two grandbabies, and we've got one hell of a staff that stepped up and showed up and made a difference. Whether it's the governor's brother, also known as Pickle, he's here somewhere, his wife. We've got a whole host of people that made a difference. And as I look around this room, I look at Louisiana, and all I can say is thank you, thank yes. you, thank you. Yes. I love you for what you've done for me and my family, and I trust you. We will love you back. Yeah. We will absolutely love you back. So God bless you. Good luck, Louisiana. We're going to make a difference. Thank you so much for what you all have done. That is Sean Wilson giving his, giving his concession speech after our analyst called it, and it has been called for Jeff Landry, who is now Louisiana governor-elect. We have called up many races this evening. We have a lot more to get to. We'll have a full wrap-up of those results when we take a quick break. We'll be right back.
WWL-TV. This is the Eyewitness News at 10. Well, good evening and thank you for joining us on this election night 2023. I'm Sharice Gibson and I'm Katie Moore. Voters across the state headed to the polls today to decide who they wanted to lead the state for the next four years. And that person is Attorney General Jeff Landry. Let's take a look at the numbers tonight with 100% of the precincts not quite in yet, but Jeff Landry with 51.5% of the vote. Sean Wilson, the Democrat in the case, 26%. Stephen Wagesback, John Schroeder all coming in with less than six percent of the vote. So Jeff Landry wins it outright and avoids a runoff. Our political analysts tonight say Jeff Landry's success tonight is dependent on the record low turnout for a gubernatorial race. Our Paul Murphy is at the Jeff Landry campaign party in Broussard, Louisiana tonight. I assume it's a big party where he's at. How's the mood, Paul? You got a little uh, Zydeco music behind us here. You know we're in Acadiana and the Jeff Landry supporters will certainly be dancing into the night here at the ballroom in Broussard. Take a look. As you can see, they're all out there, not ready to go home just yet. In fact, Attorney General Jeff Landry is next door in a big tent, still mingling with the crowd. Now, Attorney General Jeff Landry was the front runner from start to finish during the race for Louisiana governor, and that's where he ended up on election night. Landry will be the next governor after winning more than 50% of the vote in a very crowded field. He got the early endorsement of the state Republican Party and many of the state's top officials, and they paid off big tonight. In his speech, he told supporters here at Broussard, he asked the crowd, do you love Louisiana? Because I love Louisiana. Landry said this race was always about family, and that is what we're going to work why we're going to work to fix this state. He also said tonight's election was historic. It's a clear signal <coughs> that our state is united. I'm sorry, there's like a fog machine in this room here. He said our state is united. It's a wake up call. It's time to work. Expect more out of our government. And tonight's, ele tonight's election, make no mistake about it, it was historic. It was a clear signal. Tonight's election says that our state is united and it's a wake up call. It's a message that everyone should hear loud and clear that we, the people of this state, are going to expect more out of our government from here on out. And you know, I'm not joking when I say we. I mean, there are so many people out there, so many of you who are all a part of this. I can't name you all, but you know who you are. I want to recognize our staff, unbelievable. Our volunteers were just amazing. The activists, everyone who worked extra hard. Those who invested both treasure and sweat in this election. I want you to know that those people gave the people of this state an election that was about you. This election was always about the people of this state. Hey. Yeah. And to me, that is the most important accomplishment of tonight, that we were able to focus on you because that's what we're gonna continue to focus on. Because when we focus on you, that's how we create success. And I believe that Louisiana is ready to become one team that rejects the past and embraces the future. Amen. And that is Attorney General and the Governor-elect Jeff Landry speaking just about an hour ago here in Broussard. Again, they got that fog machine going on in this. It's kind of gagging me in here, but we'll try to get through it here. And uh, Jeff Landry also told his supporters that you can party tonight but we have a lot of work to still to do. So we're live in Bruce Hart, Paul Murphy, Eyewitness News. All right, Paul, Poor thank you so Paul much. Paul, with that fog machine. Oh my goodness, <laughs> I hope we get some water. Oh man. All right, so I believe Sean Wilson was the only major Democratic candidate in the governor's race, the former state transportation secretary. He finished in second place behind Jeff Landry. Yeah, our Whitney Miller has been at Wilson's campaign party tonight. She joined us live now from, uh, from there with the latest.
do we have Whitney? Okay, we're, we're trying to, okay, we're trying to figure out exactly what's going on with our producer and with our shows, but mm -hmm. of course we have a lot of numbers that we can take a look at because obviously, Katie, and you've been talking about it with the analysts a lot. Uh, this race, uh, it, it's a history-making race, and right now we did not know that Jeff Landry would get it outright. It started off very strong, and it seems like he maintained that number. Yeah, he did, and you can see there the numbers on your screen. Again, not quite 100% of precincts reporting. Many of those last precincts coming in here in Orleans Parish. Uh, which was not enough in order to push Jeff Landry into a runoff with Sean Wilson, the Democrat in the race. Our analysts saying uh, Jeff Landry's well-orchestrated campaign is one of the reasons that he was successful tonight. Uh, and there are um, that that is one of the main reasons that he was able to pull it out in addition to the low turnout. Now, another area that was uh, hotly contested races was in Jefferson Parish. All right, we go to Leah McNeil right now. Uh, she is at uh, Jennifer Van Franken's campaign headquarters this evening where they are celebrating a victory. Uh, Leah. Sharice and Katie, good evening. Yes, it is a party out here in Metairie. Jennifer Van Vranken be out incumbent. Ricky Templet for that Division 8 Council at Large seat. Woman of the Hour is joining me now. Jennifer, congratulations on your big win, beating out an incumbent. This means you get to serve the people of Jefferson Parish, parish-wide. How are you feeling about this win? I'm so excited. Uh, you said Woman of the Hour. It's kind of <laughs> late, and uh, I'm so glad people are still here and celebrating. It was really hard fought. You know, there were a lot of political forces against Against us, but the people really embraced us and were with us, and I'm just very appreciative. This job every day is about serving the people of the parish and serving them well, and to be able to go from the Metairie community I've served, um, and I think people have been pleased, to now the opportunity to serve our whole parish, people in every community, I'm really excited. Absolutely. I know first things on a lot of people's mind, crime, of course, quality of life, continuing to work on that. What are some things that you are going to ta tackle head on once you step into that role? At large really gives us the opportunity to focus on those things that affect the whole parish. And so insurance is really one of those most pressing issues. All the quality of life improvements we have, they're not going to matter if people can't afford to be here. Um, we've, I've started to educate myself on it, but now really I'm going to have the opportunity to, to find every way that we can change our insurance market for the better. We can't do all of that, you know, at the parish level, but there are things, I met a couple last week, they said they had something called a wind assessment on their house. $300 wind assessment, their insurance got cut in half. It's those kinds of things that I'm really looking forward to getting educated on, finding everything that we can do to solve that problem. And so I'll get to work Monday morning. Absolutely. Anything else you want to say to maybe some people who voted for the incumbent or, you know, some folks on the West Bank are not really sure, you know, how can you apply what you've done in Metairie in your district uh, parish-wide? Yes. I, I can commit to everybody 100%. You're going to see me at your meetings. You're going to see me in your community. I'm going to be listening because if I serve well, it's going to be a partnership. You know, I need people to tell me what I need to work on for them. And so I'm just excited to have this opportunity. Absolutely. From Metairie to Grand Isle, right? Metairie to Grand Isle and everywhere, everywhere in between. between. All right, Jennifer, thank you so much. Congratulations again. I'll let you get back to the party again. Jennifer Van Vranken, she will take over as councilman, uh, councilwoman rather, um, at large for that Division A seat on January 2024. Reporting live in Metairie, Leah McNeil, Eyewitness News. All right, Leah, thank you so much. All right, now we go to uh, Jefferson Parish. The council at large race incumbent Scott Walker faced a challenge from District 4 Councilman Dominic Impostato. But after the votes were counted, Walker held on to his seat. In his victory speech, Walker talked about uh, the sometimes nasty tone of the campaign. Four years ago, yesterday and tonight, we have proven that people still decide elections. People in Jefferson Parish, real people decide elections. And that is who I'm here for. We ran a very positive campaign, which is what I said we were gonna do from day one. We were not gonna get dirty, we were not gonna get into the weeds, we were gonna be positive, and we were gonna talk about me and what I've done over the past four years. Unfortunately, on the other side, there were lies, there, were, there was deception, there was misinformation that proliferated throughout this parish. And it's frustrating, but we didn't say a word. And there's a lot more I'd like to say tonight that I'm not. 
because we're going to continue to be positive and we're going to continue to do what we've done for the past four years and for the people of Jefferson Parish. The last thing I'd like to say is that I think we've proven in this campaign that we have a hell of a lot of workhorses. A lot of workhorses and no show horses. Well, that District 4C covers North Kenner and parts of West Metairie, and now he has another term in office. In the middle of covering tonight's elections, WWL-TV got an exclusive chance to speak with Congressman Steve Scalise. He just returned to Louisiana days after withdrawing his name from the U.S. House Speaker's race. He spoke with Meg Ferris in Metairie. She joins us live now with more on that interview. Meg? Well, Katie, um, we're at Drago's, which now has emptied out. Everyone is gone. The wait staff is picking up. This is where the campaign party was for two people who won their election tonight, um, Hans Liljeburg, and also re-elected to the state Senate was Cameron Henry, who you may recall had all those flyers come out using Nudie, the Nutria, as um, one of his campaign platforms. But as you said, Steve Scalise uh, was in New Orleans, or here in Metairie rather, and he came and gave a speech on the stage. And then afterwards, he talked to us exclusively. Here's part of what he said. You know, our number continued to grow throughout the week. We, you know, we'd actually grown a pretty strong number, but there were about 20 members that still weren't there. And, you know, when you need 218 on the House floor uh, and you don't have a real margin, we, you know, we weren't quite at the number. So, you know, things were going well. They kept getting better. But, you know, we hit a wall. We looked at a lot of things. And as you can tell, even today, uh, you know, there's still those same kind of impediments. So we have a, you know, a lot of internal issues that we got to work out within our conference that are still being worked out. You know, but one of the things I said is, if it's not going to be there for me, I didn't do this for the title. Uh, I'm not going to be the reason that we don't get our house back open again. We've got to get Congress function again. You know, I've been working with a lot of our committee chairmen. We have a resolution ready to go in strong support of Israel. During that interim, when I was the speaker designee, I was talking to some of our world leaders. I talked to the ambassador of Israel about very specific needs that they have right now. Iron Dome missile replenishment, some very targeted uh, missile guidance systems that we have that we need to get them that we can't with Congress not in action. And so it's much bigger than me or anybody else. I said, I'm not going to be an impediment to getting this done. We've got to get Congress back open because there is so much at stake. And there's a, another temporary shutdown looming as well. Um, do you think, we, we see you get up there and give a strong speech and looking wonderful, but do you think some people were concerned about the health problems that you were going through, or the health battle you're fighting right now? I know there was a lot of genuine concern, and I shared that with my colleagues, and wonderful love and outpouring of support as I was diagnosed with cancer about two months ago. I've got a wonderful team here in New Orleans, been working with other doctors as well, some of the world leaders, all are in agreement that what we, you know, there's some really good chemotherapy treatments for myeloma. It's a blood cancer. Uh, there have been remarkable breakthroughs, and I've been blessed by God to, to be able to uh, quickly get on drugs that are available for people with my form of cancer, and it's working. It's knocked out almost all of the cancer, and they've actually reduced the amount of time I need to be on chemotherapy. Uh, but we're not going to slow down on that. My health's been better than it's ever been in months. They finally found out what was wrong with me, and it's being treated. That's wonderful, Steve. What do you think it will take uh, to not go through 15 votes like it did for former Speaker McCarthy? What do you think it will take for the uh, Republican majority, which is majority by a few people, what will it take to bring them together and elect someone? Yeah, we still only have a three-seat majority, so clearly uh, every thread of a needle can collapse any coalition. And so I've been talking to a lot of members over the last few days. I still get a lot of members texting me that we're not only part of my team, but weren't there, that you know, we're trying to work through how to get there so we can resolve this quickly, hopefully in the next few days when we come back Monday. Uh, I'm still the majority leader of the House. That's not changing. So that means I still am directly involved in putting a lot of those coalitions together. So I've been having those conversations, you know, even when I got out of the Speaker's race, still working to try to help put it together so we can get Congress back open again. Again, there's much work that needs to be done in Washington, and I'll be at the heart of it. We're doing a lot of planning right now for when we get this resolved, hopefully in the next few days. 
That was Mike Ferris with an exclusive interview with Steve Scalise tonight on all of the world events that have been centered with him. We have much more election coverage coming up for you ahead. We're going to check in on Sean Wilson, who's the Democrat in the race for governor, right after the break. In the governor's race, the former state transportation secretary finished in second place behind Jeff Landry. How Whitney Miller has been at Wilson's campaign party all night, and he joins us from there. Uh, she joins us from there now, and Whitney, uh, he gave a rather uh, spirited uh, uh, concession speech. <laughs> he did, you know. Um you, you never want to be in a room where it's kind of sad uh, at, after someone takes a loss, but it was not sad in this room today. He came in with his concession speech with hope for the future. He says his work is not done. His job now is to hold uh, the new governor accountable. Um, he said he is proud of the race that he ran. Take a listen. And there are no regrets in the Wilson household. No. Because we made a difference in the state of Louisiana. Yes, the difference one makes is not always the outcome that one would have, but we made a difference in this race. And I reflect on the fact that I called Jeff Landry and congratulated him on the victory tonight because the citizens of Louisiana spoke or didn't speak and made a decision. That's right. And every good American, every good Louisianian accepts those consequences. Yeah. And he went on to say that he went on to say that it is up to the voters, up to the residents of Louisiana, to hold their elected officials accountable. Uh, so his hope is that people get involved and do their civic duties of voting, but also holding those elected officials accountable. For now, live at the Westin, Whitney Miller, Eyewitness News.
Thank you. All right, Whitney, thank you. Now, voters over in St. Tammany Parish went to the polls today to pick their next leader for the next four years. Yeah, they had to choose between the man who has been their parish president since 2020 or the mayor of one of the parish's biggest cities. Uh, taking a look at the numbers right now, Mike Cooper, 51% of that vote against Greg Cromer. Uh, very pretty, really tight race here. Mm -hmm, absolutely. It certainly was tight. Two big names in St. Tammany politics. We do have crews at both of their campaigns, and Rachel Hanley is at Greg Cromer. We begin with Lily Cummings, who's over at Mike Cooper's campaign. Lily? Katie, Charisse, it has been quite an evening here in Covington, but I'm joined by St. Tammany Parish President for the next four years again. Mike Cooper, how are you feeling tonight? I feel great. <laughs> I feel great. Uh, the citizens of St. Tammany chose to, by a close margin, but by uh, a margin to uh, elect me to serve for the next four years. And I'm very proud to, uh, to have served the last four years and looking forward to the next four years. And I know you said you might take off on Monday. This has been a hard fought race, a long race. <laughs> but what comes in the next four years after that little break on Monday? Well, for the next four years, we're going to continue to do what we've done the past four years is to address how growth and, and development has outpaced infrastructure, and we're going to continue to invest heavily in providing investments in roads, bridges, drainage, and water and sewer utilities, and completing our planning initiatives so that we can have a foundation for smart, sustainable growth in the future. We were expecting kind of a shakeup, right, with the St. Tammany Parish Council. Have you been able to look at any of those results, and what were your thoughts on the folks that uh, were able to capture those seats? Well, right off the bat, we knew that there would be five or six new council members uh, based on those who weren't running again. But with uh, with those races, some of those races being decided, we've got some uh, new council members, and um, I have uh, a great relationship with many of the candidates in all of the districts, and we have a commitment to work together to, for the betterment of St. Tammany Parish. All right, well, we have a lot of St. Tammany Parish behind me here, and I think they have something that they wanted to say, right? Four more years! Four more years! Four there you have it, live in St. Tammany, Lily Cummings, Eyewitness News. All right, Lily, thank you so much. We, of course, will continue to follow along with the campaign results of our 2023 election. And we'll also have a look at your forecast with Alexandra Cranford when we get back.
All right, we get to talk about the weather now, and it is really good news all around with our weather. We have beautiful fall weather. It's already here, and it's sticking around for quite some time into the next several days. We will be warming up at the latter part of this week, but we have another front moving in Thursday night, maybe into Friday. That should bring at least a chance for rain, but the one thing we could use that we don't have in the forecast is some rain. But hey, still very pleasant fall weather. It's 67 in New Orleans. Nice dry air with that front, which is already passed in our temperatures right now. Some of us getting into the upper 50s far north of the lake. The rest of us mainly in the 60s. Only the lakefront saying 70 degrees near those warmer lake waters and our wind and gusts coming in from the north northwest. There are some gusts near 20 miles per hour, but most of us have about 5 to maybe 10 or 12 mile per hour winds. Our overnight temperatures get into the middle 50s north of the lake and close to 60 south of the lake. So that's a cool morning to a lot of us for early tomorrow and then the afternoon looks almost perfect. High temperatures around 72. Looks like a cooler day compared to today, of course, and then also we'll have breezy conditions, mostly sunny skies, and those northwest winds up to about 18 miles per hour. Tons of festivals, tons of events going on this time of year, especially for tomorrow, right in the middle of October, and we have almost perfect weather. In fact, our models have been showing temperatures even a little lower than earlier today. This one has us topping out only around 69 or 70 degrees. So a bit coolish even for tomorrow afternoon. What we have is surface low pressure here, and this is a trough of low pressure, but it will have the effect of just reinforcing that cool air over the next couple of days. Also notice this surface high getting close to us. This takes us to Tuesday. Around this high, we continue with northerly flow. So that's drier, cooler air from up north. But of course, the high tends to shift to the east. And when that happens, it changes the direction, brings in those winds from the southeast. And that's what usually tends to warm us up this time of year, where we have the cool front. And then we get the warming up at the end of whatever period that is and then we get another cool front so this is our seven day forecast we're looking for temperatures tomorrow again 72 or so for monday we're looking for sunny skies and our high about 70 degrees for tuesday we're looking at 40s for the morning north of the lake 50 south of the lake with high temperatures around 71 so still a cool day on tuesday Wednesday, a chilly morning, and Thursday, probably the same thing, but notice those temperatures getting up to near 80 or at least upper 70s. Thursday and Thursday night right now looks like our next chance for rain with our next front. Models have it solidly Thursday night right now, but that tends to change, of course, since we're still several days out. So we'll keep you updated there for now, though, looking like Thursday night, some showers. And then Friday and Saturday, notice not a huge cool down. We'll see. Right now, it looks like temperatures may just kind of stay somewhat steady or just get enough of a cool air shot to kind of keep us in that pleasant range moving into next weekend. But either way, next weekend looks like a beauty as well with more fall weather, sunny skies and low humidity.
So one of the council races we've been following closely is over in Jefferson Parish. Yeah, pit at current councilman Byron Lee against Jefferson Parish School Board Vice President Derek Shepard. It was a very tight race, but Byron Lee is holding on to his seat. Eleanor Tabone got a chance to speak with Lee after the race was called. Incumbent Byron Lee will keep his seat as District 3 Councilman. Lee won 52% of the votes. His opponent, Derek Shepard, coming in with a close 48%. District 3 covers much of the West Bank as well as a portion of Kenna. Lee was all smiles after hearing he'd won. The councilman says he intends to carry on the work he'd been doing before the election. Uh, moving forward, we want to focus on the uh, projects that we have uh, that have not started construction or, or within construction we have not completed. Mm -hmm. And so we have millions of dollars uh, in projects throughout the district and we want to see that that continues to move forward. And then in addition to that, we want to look at all the other needs that exist in our districts on both East Bank and West Bank and make sure that uh, we can uh, pr uh, appropriate money toward uh, getting things done in those areas. For all your election coverage, you can head to the WWL TV website or download the app. Eleanor Tabone, Eyewitness News. We have all of the election results available on our website, WWLTV.com. We'll be right It's all on the WWL. All right, we want to continue to take a look at the numbers, our election results, uh, looking at our uh, parish presidents, and we had a few of them up for re-election. We did. There were quite a few. The St. Bernard Parish President's race is headed to a runoff tonight. Louis Palms and Wayne Landry are, uh, uh, you know, neck and neck in that race, 42 to 36 percent. They will face a runoff. Other parish presidents as well were at stake. St. Charles Parish President Matt Jewell re-elected easily 76 percent of the vote tonight. He's, of course, an incumbent who's already been serving in St. Charles. 
And then St. John. In St. John, the sheriff's race. Mike Traig won easily re-election as the sheriff of St. John Parish. 71% to Jarrett Vicknair with 29% of the vote. And of course, you can always get all of the election results for all of the races on our website, WWLTV.com. As more votes start to come in, we, of course, uh, will keep you updated. And that's our news for now. Thanks for watching. We'll see you right back here tomorrow at 7 for the Sunday edition of the Eyewitness Morning News. And until then, have a great night.